Good morning, everybody. We're thrilled to be joining you at the 19th Fearless Caregiver Conference in, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. And my uh, partner in crime, Bev Kidder. How are you, Bev? I am wonderful. And I am so happy to have you here in New Haven. Even though you're 1,500 miles away, you're here in New Haven in heart and soul. So welcome. Um, I'm Beverly Kidder. I am the Vice President of Community Programs at the Agency on Aging of South Central Connecticut. And we are thrilled to be uh, uh, hosting this 19th conference in Connecticut. Uh, and I know out there, there are many of you who have been at all 19 of them with us. So uh, welcome back. It's, it's wonderful to see you. We have um, an awful lot crammed in to never enough time when you get to talk with friends. So we're really happy to have you here. On behalf of uh, all of the staff at the Agency on Aging, we welcome each of you, all of the participants, and thank each of you who are willing to be presenters and most especially to thank Gary for being our gracious host. So go along, Gary, what's next? <laughs> well, if we were in person, uh, I'd hug everybody because virtual hugs are not as fun as real ones, but accept this as my virtual hug. My name is Gary Barg, for anybody who doesn't know. Um, I'm founder and editor-in-chief of uh, today's Caregiver Magazine, our current issue. With, uh, what is that on the cover? Jennifer Gray. Oh, yes, I see her now, yes. Yeah. I saw her behind you and I was wondering, who's that? Yeah, no, she talks, uh, actually, it's a very good uh, conversation. She's talking about getting your flu. She calls it a uh, shot. She calls it, they call it uh, flu shot Friday, which means uh, take your loved ones, take your daughter, take your, your, your grandmother you're caring for, go for ice cream, go out for a walk, and then go to a drugstore and get your flu shot. Make it part of a, of a fun day. Because unfortunately, um, the flu is back with a vengeance. Last year, obviously, we were doing all the right things in a sense to not, not have flu. Uh, we were masking, social distancing, not going out, not traveling so much. And flu went down, you know, by 80%. Unfortunately, they're looking for it to come back with vengeance. And it's dangerous, too. So uh, it's a great conversation. Uh, you could find the digital edition on caregiver.com or get some print editions if you want. I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, all of the agencies on aging in the country um, are, are getting some of this uh, ARPA money that's coming out. And one of the targets for it is to try and include regular flu shots along with the, the urgency of getting vaccines for uh, the coronavirus. And at our agency, we'll have a program to um, drive people there, schedule the appointments for them, just for their regular flu shots to make sure that we try to keep regular flu down. It's, it's, it's really, it's those kind of things that you, you, you never really think about, but this year you have to think about because it's truly back with a vengeance. So uh, that's a great conversation. We have a lot of other uh, interesting uh, information in there, the Caregiver Friendly Award winners for this year. So anyway, um, I'm also the author of uh, the books, The uh, Fearless Caregiver, which is in its fourth edition, I think, How to Get the Best Care for Your Loved Ones, Still Have a Life of Your Own. Um, I'm looking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you Are Not Alone, which is actually interesting. Um, some of the uh, best uh, information advice in that You Are Not Alone book has come from what we've learned from caregivers at in New Haven. We've yeah. done uh, 287 in-person and eight virtual events so far in 45 cities and 27 states. And every time we go, we learn, you know, hopefully we teach a little, we share a little, we do a little Johnny Apple seeding of caregiver information, but we always pick up information, tips, because every caregiver has a, a piece of the puzzle that that other caregivers need, like turn your phone off when you're on a <laughs> webinar, dummy, sorry. Um, so what, what's kind of fun about that too is uh, the, the, uh, that's, we call it a uh, conference in your living room because it's chock full of the information. We can't make up all the professionals on the panels when the caregivers answer questions that another caregiver asks, they're sitting there taking notes. Oh my God, that's incredible. 
because you've all mastered some part of caring for somebody you care for and there's a lot of overlap. So it's, it's, you have to share, you have to be involved. You, you can't, isolation is a killer. Um, you can't isolate. It is. And, and you not only learn things, you know, like practical tips, uh, how do you get someone to turn from left to right when you're trying to get them in the car? Wonderful practical tips. But I remember for my own self, there also was that sense that, all right, nobody's got it perfect. I'm doing the best I can. They're doing the best they can it's going to work out, you know, some of that sense of, of support from other people who've been there, because some of these things, if your father doesn't want to give up the keys and you have to take them away and take his sense of manhood away, there's no easy way to do that. There's no tip that's going to make it not heartbreaking. But then when you start to see how many people have been through it and faced it, you do draw some support from that. So I, I think that we actually have from the experts is so important. And the experts are the caregivers. Every oh, caregiver of course. Is, you know, for caring for a loved one. It ain't one. you. It ain't me. It's the caregivers. I'm just, the, I said, just Johnny Appleseed, like learning something in one city, sharing it with the caregivers in another city or on our, or on our newsletter. Uh, the other interesting thing that has a lot to do with uh, New Haven is that um, the, the, the second book is Caregiving Ties That Bind are the lessons that we've learned from that point, it was about 150 uh, caregivers with fa famous faces who on the uh, cover of the magazine, because the thing that we don't realize, we think yeah, some, everyone else has it better. Oh, they're famous or rich. They're still a, a, a son, a daughter, a parent, uh, someone caring for someone they care about. And so it, in a sense, it, it alleviates a little bit of the, um, they're going, they're going through, they're not going through something. And I am, it, I think it's, it's helpful. We also have had um, the caregivers with famous faces at our um, in-person events. Um, we've had uh, uh, Clay, Debbie Reynolds, Della Reese, Clay Walken, Clay Walker, Clay Aiken, and some have joined us in Connecticut specifically uh, who are wonderful, Linda Dano, Henry Winkler, and uh, Patricia Richardson. Yeah. Great, great, fun, terrific, loving people, caregivers. Caregiving is a great equalizer. The other fun thing is that um, some of these um, uh, caregivers with famous faces brought their dogs. So that was, <laughs> that's, that's obvious. They won you right away. <laughs> that's obviously important to me. Um, I think your so, dog looks like Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> He's got the 1890s handlebar mustache. So... He was sleeping until he heard me talking to somebody. He thought, oh, food? Oh. <laughs> Must be a snack in here somewhere. Must be a snack. I, I love that we get to spend time again together. You know, uh, the, the in-person part, we're going to do, we're going to get back to maybe the, the 20th year. You never know. Yeah. Uh, but this, what we've learned, and, and actually you're the one who, it's your fault, uh, who told us deep into 2020, start doing it virtually. And I thought, wow, it's not going to be the same. And, so, and the very first one we did was right here in, in New Haven, although I'm in Florida. Um, and for the next seven, the, the, the Fort Worth and Tampa and Fort Lauderdale, the same energy, enthusiasm, uh, the questions, instead of raising your hand, I would ask you guys to go to the look at the bottom of your screen. You see the Q and A, U Q will A. Stick your questions in there. And my own personal Vanna White, Sue Hamilton, who uh, from the area agency, will be um, sharing those messages, those questions, those comments, the responses, the answers. Remember the thing about the Fearless Caregiver Conference is you have as many important answers as the professionals do. Some, so somebody asks a question and you say, oh, I figured that out. Go to the queue, go to the chat and, and pop that in. And Vanna, I mean, Sue will, um, will, uh, will share that with us. Yes. And Gary, we have questions coming in already. Really? I didn't do it. Yes. Whatever it is. <laughs> what you got? Okay. So one of our um, attendees would like us to touch on guardian issues with probate. Oh, that's a Steve Rubin answer. Yeah. I see it. <laughs> and then we have an, an, another question. Um, they want to know 
uh, what panel members or type of questions to answer people positions will be on panels one and two so that they can prepare their questions in advance. That's a really, really good. Um, first of all, any panel is gonna be magnificent because uh, every panel that we've seen in New Haven and frankly, all the, uh, all the other events have been terrific. So if you have a question, if it's a legal question, pop it up in the first panel. Uh, uh, Alexandra's here from Mary Wade and she, she can help us uh, understand uh, how to deal with um, uh, adult day, how to get your family members to accept, how to partner with them, the value proposition and why it's important to realize what adult day is about. The second panel, we have uh, uh, Maraid, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have Bonnie, we have Maria and Jack, and uh, that's uh, ombudsman and uh, the VA, which is very important, by the way. If you, um, your loved one, your your father, your mother, you, you know, did anything, was a veteran, spouse of a veteran, a widow of a veteran, widow or a veteran, you must um, get these questions answered. Because the, the, the thing about it is, and Bonnie will tell you this, is that if you are dealing with um, uh, veteran issues five years ago, and now you're dealing with it again, oh, I know everything. No, you don't. Things change so fast. And you know these, these caregiver coordinators at the VA are your care managers. They are wonderful. And I I've, I've just love having them on the panel. Ombudsman, you have a loved one uh, in a long-term care facility. I could be mis, mis, misstating this or even in uh, dealing in, at home care and you need uh, support, advice. You need somebody on your side. That's what an ombudsman does. Uh, Jack Vale, uh, you may have you may have met him yet, uh, last year. If you have a family uh, that that you care about and you love, and you want to be prepared for when you or your loved ones uh, pass, you must 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 listen to, to Jack's information. So, uh, and S Steve Rubens on the first panel, legal legal mind, non paralleled, uh, just excellent. Uh, so. As I say, it's uh, uh, Bev Kidder, who, of course, can answer anything. Uh, uh, Steve Rubin, uh, Alexandra's. Uh, now, did I get that right? Yes. Um, Sadowski. I was going to say da Sadowski, so I apologize for that. Um, and this is one good reason for Vanna White to be here, because as I age, I'm <laughs> looking, at, looking at these things and it's like what what's that <laughs> yeah and gary uh, the point uh, used to work for me yeah and we also have uh several people asking if there's going to be a recording available of yes. the conference and how people can obtain that after the conference is done uh we're going to send it to you we're going to put it on uh, our youtube channel put it on caregiver.com and all the emails we have of anybody who helped us get to people all your emails um, I'm going to edit the piece, edit out all my goofs and, uh, nobody else is going to goof. So there's no problem there. And we're just, we're going to literally send it to you, uh, probably, uh, within the next two weeks. So, all right. Uh, what next, Ms. Kidder, Dr. Kidder? Oh, geez. I don't know. I, I, we probably should get this panel started because they really have lots of content that, um, people want to share. And, um, I, I know that the, our participants are eager to hear that, but I think you and I will have lots to say during the, the course of the morning. They can't shut us up. No. <laughs> oh. you, there you go. So um, if I could ask my beloved first panel to sign in, please. Dun, 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 Alexandra and Stephen, that's you. Dun, 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 dun. How are you, sir? Uh oh. Good. How are you? How are you, ma'am? Good. Good morning. Stephen, I, I like it. I really like it when you're in that um, incredible CIA uh, computer room with 15 miles of, of, uh, of uh, servers behind you. So, right. <laughs> I miss that. Unfortunately, right now, they're at a bunch of the servers are literally a part of my desk because I'm rebuilding them. See, see uh, also, it'll be back. Top, top line computer geeks. So, if you have any computer questions which I do, um, 
And then we lost Alexandra. Oh, no. Oh, oh, hi. They keep switching around on me. You know, it's like, uh, what, what, was, what was that old game show where everybody was Hollywood Squares? It's a <laughs> squares move. So let me uh, ask you guys to uh, introduce yourself, why you're here, wh what you want to help caregivers learn, and, and who you are. Let's start with Alexandra. Hello, good morning. So my name is Alexandra, you can call me Allie, I'm director of the Adult Day Center um, at Mary Wade Home. Um, and I'm here, I hope to share and answer any of questions that you might have for me about our services and explain a little bit more about the importance of Adult Day Center and what we have to offer. And it's my first time joining this panel, so I'm very excited um, to be a part of this today. And hopefully, you know, we can connect and share some stories and I can't wait to hear from you guys. Well, we love Mary Wade. You, you guys always join us in, in person. And, uh, people get a lot of advice and, and support from you guys. And, and Adult Day is one of my sweet spots. So thank you for being here. Dr. Rubin. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Steve Rubin. I'm a certified elder law attorney. Uh, I also practice special needs planning, disability, public veterans, veterans benefits. Uh, I get around a little bit and apparently computers. Um, so ask me anything, I guess. I do, I do want to ask the panelists as you pop in, uh, if you put your contact information in the chat so people can know how to uh, get to you uh, after, after this. And Gary, we have a question uh, for Steve. Um, yes, Vanna. One, one of our attendees has a situation with an older sibling in DDS of Connecticut. Um, she's his legal guardian and she's in a very serious situation with him and needs help. She uh, stated that the ombudsman did not help her and she's very disappointed and she's looking for help with this. She's called so many people and hasn't been able to get any assistance. Well, I, without knowing the problem, it's hard to really say, you know, hey, this is what you need to do. Um, so I think what the issue is will determine where you should go for help. Right, the OMS Budsman and everyone else, I, I know that they really do try to help with what they can, but sometimes you need the an attorney just to get involved and send a letter or make a call. So if I knew more about the situation, I could probably give you better advice. Let's talk, Steve, a little bit about the partnership you need when your loved one is in a long-term care uh, facility. I'm dealing with that uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 months or so. And um, staff turnovers and and challenges in service. Sure. But what what's the partnership you see that's uh, uh, the role the caregiver plays in making sure their loved one gets the best care they can when they're in a long term care facility? I know people a lot of times. Oh, I don't want to be a squeaky wheel. They'll treat my loved one bad. I you know. Um, do you have any advice on that? I do. It's not legal advice. It's just you know, what I lived through as a caregiver, right? So uh, I am that squeaky wheel. Uh, I'm a pain in the neck every time my dad's gotten sick, you know, whether it was you know, during COVID, he was hospitalized for surgery on nine occasions in the last uh, year and a half. Every time he goes in, I make sure I'm annoying, especially in the early stages when I couldn't get in. I would was on the phone, making sure he was getting the care he needed because he would tell me, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting that. No. Sometimes he might have gone and just forgot. Sometimes he wasn't. So I think as caregivers, you know, in Connecticut, we call it the healthcare representative. And I personally hate the term because we're not representatives. Our job is to be an advocate and it's to have that open communication. And part of that communication is understanding that, hey, sometimes we're not always given the, the best information. You know, I've had clients tell me, oh, you know, this facility didn't do something that one, the facility we figured out did, or in some cases legally can't be doing. And we have to be understanding of those things too. You know, everyone in general tries to do their best. Um, so you have to kind of make sure you have those open lines of communication. Most problems we see come from the lack of communication. Most misunderstandings, most family arguments. You know, every time there's a fight between family members about care, it's usually because someone's not communicating with another person. So if we just sit down and start that open lines of communication with the facility and with everyone else, it really helps to prevent problems before they even start. 
So I think that would be my best advice is just, just start talk, the conversation, talk with the facility, meet the staff, meet the people who are involved, you know, let them know what your expectations are. Let them tell you what they think they can or can't do for you. And if there is an issue, don't jump in and just go, Hey, let's have a fight. Just start the conversation. Cause if you go into a facility, if you walk into Mary Wade and you go in screaming and yelling, you're not going to get anywhere. That's the wrong approach. But if you went in and said, hey, I think this is an issue. Can we talk about it? You get a lot farther with that. So there's a difference between being the squeaky wheel and just being a PETA. Squeaky wheel is okay. PETA can be depending on how you do it. But most of the time, it's not a good thing. If you push too hard or you just go in looking for the fight, you won't get anywhere. And a lot of times, simple conversation fixes everything. Like good, all good care professional and family caregiver relationships, it's a partnership. Absolutely. It's a, it's a team. Everyone has to be on the team. And the head of the team is really the person who's getting the care. Because at the end, the goal is to make sure that they're getting protected, that they're getting the care that they need. So everyone else on the team has to work for the one goal. We, we always you know, say- I, I wanted to you... remind pe- people also that in this afternoon's panel, we'll have a um, Mairead uh, Painter on who's uh, from the long-term care cop a program who is our ombudsman for um, uh, nursing homes and other institutional care. So she can address perhaps some of these questions in more detail. They have had a hell of a year. We know how awful things were in nursing homes because of COVID. And I'm sure they were not able to deal with every single case in the way that they would have liked to under normal circumstances. But she'll be here this afternoon and, and she can handle some of those questions as well. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled she's going to be here. Um, Alex, let me, uh, Ali, by the way, my nieces, my older, my older of the two nieces names. So I love calling you Ali. So thank you for that. Um, you, w- one of the other things that, you know, there's, there's a spectrum of care that you can have with your, your loved one. It could be long-term care. It could be nursing home, it, it, uh, but it also could be, a partnership between home care, adult day, and you know, making sure that there's there's this coverage. Um, I have always said that adult day care gave my grandfather at 90 three more years of quality life. Um, it, it the challenge was getting him to accept it. You know, when we finally realized what he was thinking, he was he was a president of the Miami Art League, a wonderful uh, artist. And so we said, uh, Graham, you're going to teach art. These people need you. And instead of his, you know, handcrafted brushes and his handmade frames, it was coloring books and crayons. And he had three students sleeping, but he went to teach art. And, and you know, the, the day off, the days off, we'd say, you know, oh, Graham, you're on vacation. Once we reframed the perspective of what he was doing, where he was going, he wasn't going to be around at 90 years old, all those old people, how, tell me the value proposition of adult day, but also help me if I'm having a challenge, get my loved one to accept why they should go and how I can explain that and what you've heard. One, one quick thing is I talked to an adult day executive director. I've talked to a few all over the country. I guess the joke is they actually have more volunteers than clients because everybody thinks they're going to volunteer to help those old people. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Too. I mean, you kind of hit it on the head there by um, just that story alone. And we have several stories like that as well. Um, we recently just had um, an individual start our adult day program that very hesitant um, had dementia and, you know, his daughter um, was almost a little bit more hesitant because she was going to be worried about what her dad was doing. Um, very attached to her, constantly looking for her. Um, And he was going, and that was his place that he was going to help sing. He sings, right? So he wants to teach individuals like a choir. So every time he comes, I mean, he does have a phenomenal voice. Um, That is what he thinks he's going to do. And now he thinks that, oh my God, my daughter is going shopping again. Like, that's why I'm here is because she's got to go shopping. So it is so important. Um, to just kind of know the types of services that we offer. It's never easy, right, to try to convince a loved one to do something out of the norm that they haven't done. Um, They're 
adamant about staying home, right? They, that's what they want to do. Like you said, oh, I don't want to go and just be with old people. What they don't understand is how absolutely important it is for them to be around other individuals their age and how stimulating it can actually be for them. Um, to know these community integrated programs is what our adult day center, you know, is all about. It's aimed and it helps to really truly prevent even sometimes delay the need for an institutionalization, right. For a loved one. Um, so we do do a bunch of trials. Um, we even invite the loved ones, you know, to come in as well, um, to be with them, um, for a few hours, I would say, you know, trials are really important to reach out to a center and ask, you know, oh, okay, dad and I want to come and, you know, we're just interested to see what you guys have to offer. Um, we had some, a lady call me and said, you know, my, my loved one's going to be very hesitant about coming. How can I get her there? And I said, well, let me send like an invitation to your home and say, I'm inviting you to join this. She thought it was wonderful. This lady showed up. So she's like, I don't know how you got my name but thank you. I'm a bingo caller. I do this. I do that. And that was a, a really good way that we got her to kind of be accepting to at least even try the program, which I thought was awesome. It's wonderful. You know, the other thing is uh, uh, my, my grandfather my, was just, just, you know, was attached to my mom. And uh, so uh, it, 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 he didn't want to leave her. And so what happened was the um, adult daycare executive director, um, made friends with them, helped them understand the value, wanted him to teach. And the first day that he was in the facility when they were just doing a, a, a sample run, um, he, she told my mom to go away, just go away, go do something, whatever you want to do, go do. And we live in South Florida. So she went to the beach, laid out a blanket. And she was on the phone all day. How's that? How's that? So from the family's point of view, it takes a little training too. Absolutely. It can be a hard sell. Um, at the Agency on Aging, we have two relationships with Adult Day. Uh, we're a funder of Adult Day programs in our community so they can give the services to more people. But then also we run a couple of respite programs for caregivers and we recommend and pay for adult day as a respite activity. And people always want the in-home service. They don't want the adult day. But after the year, um, when we go back and we sample with them how things went, the folks who use the adult day option feel that they got greater respite. They felt better. They had more time to themselves than the people who use the bring a homemaker into my house kind of option because they felt that they were there really was no relief. You know, they were watching the homemaker. They were supervising the whole activity. They were still trying to be in charge of it. But the folks who the bus came and picked up their relative, took them to the ADC, six hours of a block of time that even if all you did was went and lay down, you know, it was your time. They report on the quality uh, surveys at the end that the adult day was lifesaver, uh, felt that it extended their ability to forego having to think about institutional care for yet another year. So um, it, it's not always an easy sell, but boy, once people buy it, it, it is uh, the right sell for most people. Well, I'm a believer. I, I, I've i seen what it did for my grandfather. I saw what it did for my mom. You know, it, it, uh, it helped. Uh, and then the upside of uh, the upshot of that, that story is, the uh, executive director, Bonica Dunkley, who's, who I still knows, she just texted me, she's on the West Coast of Florida now. Um, she would go home and care for her mom and her aunt, who both living with Alzheimer's. So these are, you know, ostensibly loving, caring caregivers who are taking your loved one under their wing too, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, see, go ahead. It's so important to remember, too, that not only just adult day centers are providing, you know, that safe environment um, for your loved ones that can really help increase their self-worth, their self-esteem. But we're not only just there to support and take care of your loved one that we're just like an essential source for support for the caregivers as well. You know, um, it's an absolutely, you know, 
caregiving a demanding responsibility, right? So it's not just, you know, we're not just there taking care of your loved one and giving you that relief. Um, we're, we're really there for the families as well. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for what you do. Absolutely. Uh, thank uh, Stephen, let me, let me ask something. The caregiver walks into your office. What paperwork would you hope that they have or that you want to put together for them um, to support their <clears throat> legal rights as a family caregiver? Nothing. Because the caregiver is not my client. It needs to be the individual who actually okay. they're taking care of. Good. That's the person who I, I have to meet with and, and discuss. You can't create documents on behalf of somebody else. The individual has to create their own. So if an individual who is planning for their own care in the future came in, that'd be different. Uh, the most important document in an estate plan, everyone assumes is the will. And it's not. Because a will is only effective when we're deceased. So, That's hey, this is where my money goes when I'm dead. But to me, what's more important is what happens to my money and my assets, my care, everything else while I'm alive. So to me, the most important document is a good power of attorney. I always like to start there and work from there because powers of attorney are what allows people to pay our bills if we get sick, to make those decisions. If we need to go into a facility, if we're signing up for adult day, whatever it is, we need that power of attorney. We need that person who we trust to manage the, our finances. And the second most important one is actually the advanced directive because we want to have that person who can make those medical decisions for us if we can't. And we can't in all, some cases. And it could be a permanent change, but it can be a temporary. So it's important to have someone who can make those decisions for you when you're incapable of it or can't understand it. And then from there, we start looking at you know, what happens to our money while we're gone, whether we do wills or trust or anything. But I always start with the power of attorney, because if you don't have a power of attorney, you know, yeah, it will, will work when you're gone. Sure. But an executor has no power during your lifetime. I, I, one of the big mistakes in estate planning, and I get calls on this a lot from people is, you know, I, oh, I'm taking care of my parent and I'm their executor. Well, if you're taking care of your parent, then you're not the executor because an executor legally cannot be appointed until the individual is deceased. So you're nothing. You have no power to act. So we want a power of attorney and it's, it's probably the most important thing. And, and the power of attorney has to be made to fit the situation. You know, they're not fill in the blanks. One size fits all powers of attorney should be customized to fit the situation we're involved in, to fit the person's finances, their goals, their assets, and what we're trying to accomplish. You know, if you're married, then we might need certain terms. If you're divorced, we're going to need different terms. Because powers of attorney are only as good as the powers in them. You know, oftentimes I'll get asked, hey, is my power of attorney valid? The better question oftentimes isn't, is my power of attorney valid? Is my power of attorney any good? Because I have a ton of them that are valid and they're also useless. Now, I have a case right now with a spouse who's named on her husband's power of attorney. And it was a fill in the blank thing that they found on the internet and they did it themselves. Well, the problem is, is that the power of attorney doesn't allow her to take anything more than the required minimum distributions from his IRA. So she can't take his own money to pay for his own care. Now to fix this, because he's lost competency, I have to go to court and get a court order. So the best way to do it is to have a plan in place. It's to have these documents and understand that plans are fluid. You know, they're never going to be uh, a simple solution. It's never going to be, you know, hey, here's your plan and you're going to go exactly fill in the blank, one size fits all, connect the dots. You know, name one thing you've ever planned for in your life that has gone smoothly that you haven't had to alter it. You know, every plan gets altered. So the idea with a plan isn't to just make a permanent structure that's concrete. It's to have a, situations where you have transitions where we know where we're going to go, where we've built in the flexibility for the different things that may occur, but we're already structured to do those things. We're set up in a way where we can accomplish it. That's the key with having a plan. And everyone needs one. And it, it's not just about the individual who needs care. If you're over the age of 18, you need a plan because that's when we start becoming an adult. That's when we can't have someone 
writing our checks for us. You know, our parents no longer can control our finances or make medical decisions. You know, we need to start being adults. So everyone needs a plan. It's just that our plans have to change as we get older. I think that's, that's so incredibly important. Um, my mom's best friend, you know, 20 years ago or so, her, her, uh, her husband passed. And before he passed, he had Parkinson's. I was trying to explain to them to go to, uh, you know, some leading uh, elder care attorney and get the paperwork in place. And they didn't. And he passed and she started getting a, you know, early stage dementia. And, uh, she was just, they were very rich. So that she was just literally chum in the water. And some guy came around and married her. And they came to a holiday dinner at our house. We didn't know they were married at all. And my brother-in-law walked in and took myself, my brother into the other room and said, that guy lives in the apartment building I manage and we kicked him out. He's, he's part of a grifter group. And so I had to call, you know, the, uh, the, the, the uh, elder uh, sergeant uh, and, and I heard from her uh, stock brokerage uh, company and they were worried, everyone was worried. And she had to go through probing, which was really honestly horrible. And nobody wants to go through that. I think that's the biggest fear. If you are an adult and you haven't made your own plans, the, 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 the downside there is your, your loved ones will have to go through probate and you don't want to do that to them. Yeah. No. And, and Gary, can I chime can in? Useful, but not always. Who that? That's me. Um, I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have a question. Yes. Um, how to, how to go about acquiring power of attorney for spouse and also doing a will in a cost-effective manner. Um, so the best way to do it is to set up an appointment with an attorney. Um, it, that's the only way to really get them done correctly. I, Cost-effective is relative um, because there's, you know, it's the most expensive or least expensive thing you'll ever do is coming up with a good plan. It can be the most expensive thing you do because a bad plan costs you so much money when you're gone. You won't even know that it's working or not working. If you pass away with a will that doesn't work, you're not going to know it didn't work, but everyone else is going to face all the costs and the, everything else that comes with it. Bad powers of attorney can lead to significant asset loss. So the idea sometimes isn't to go with the cheapest. You know, you don't go with the cheapest contractor. Well, you know, with planning, you want to go with someone who actually knows what they're doing. So, and a lot of the plans that we get in are people who've done them inexpensively and it costs more to fix what was done wrong than it would have cost me to do it correctly in the first place. So rather than looking at it from a standpoint of, Hey, I want to get you know, the most cost effective. I want the one that's best for me and my spouse and making sure we're taking care of each other. That and should be the goal. Another part of that is, you know, a lawyer is not a lawyer is not a lawyer. They all have law degrees, but then people like Stephen went for years and years and years and got Especially got to become specialist in this part of law that is right. fungible and changeable and and you know the most important law you're 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 going to need and I always say you know if you you want to have open heart surgery don't go to a podiatrist your real estate attorney ain't going to help you you got to go exactly to true who knows this stuff I mean I, last time I checked I'm one of only nine attorneys certified in this in the state if there's it's a rare practice area to have this as your focus, but it's what our firm is built on and that we work to do. So go with, you know, it's exactly right. We say, don't go to your dentist for open heart surgery here, but same idea. I think it's really important for people to be aware also of the fact that um, you personally, but, but also your firm uh, and people who are trained like you, not only know what does the law say about how you can move an asset, but what are the services and programs in the committee, in the community, excuse me, that you perhaps can qualify for? And it's very important how you handle those assets so that you don't disallow yourself from getting something like the home care program or some veteran benefit or Ooh. something. And that, that's something that, you know, a very, very, very competent tax lawyer may be able to give you wonderful advice about, you know, your money and taxes and not have a clue about benefits for older adults and leave you just stranded out there where you could have saved a lot of money and so on. 
So, um, you know, it, it's not that we're selling any particular law firm, but finding that certified elder attorney and getting information from individuals who are trained and certified in the area of aging and disability, really, really important. Um, and we just see it year in and year out. People make uh, very sad mistakes. And we have Absolutely. another question for Steve too. Um, I don't keep. I don't mean to keep butting in, but no, no I want to get the question. You're, you're um, Vanna White. You have to butt in. <laughs> I wish I was Vanna White. <laughs> so um, one of our, our uh, participants. Um, the question is: How about guardianship or plenary fiduciary? Um, so guardianship and we're going to focus on Connecticut specifically. So guardianship in Connecticut is for people under the age of 18 or children with special needs or disabilities that have now turned into adulthood. It is, they have to have an IQ score below 70 to qualify. So a guardianship is very specific. So that is what a guardianship means in Connecticut. So when you say guardianship, that's for basically for a disabled child. If you're talking conservatorship, that's for an adult. So a conservatorship is for an individual who can't make decisions or understand the nature and consequences of them and is not legally competent to make either financial, medical, or both. And that requires a court order. Now, there's no such thing as a plenary fiduciary in Connecticut or plenary conservatorship. Conservators are limited to the powers the courts give them. There are certain powers that they have by statute, the certain powers that the judge can add into a situation. But there's a lot of decisions that still require court approval. You can't move somebody to a new residence. You can't sell a house without court approval. Uh, you can't change a care facility without court approval. So a lot of things with the conservatorship still require judicial supervision. So are they useful tools? It's a tool. You know, it's most often where you're going to use it is usually when you're dealing with a situation where like the family's fighting. You know, there's a lot of infighting amongst other family members. They can't agree on the situation or there is no power of attorney and no other planning occurred. So the best thing is actually to avoid them because the reality is of a conservatorship, and this is from someone who does them and gets paid more money to do them than I do for a plan. Don't go through them if you can avoid it. Get the plan. It's not dignified. You know, it, who wants their entire family history, their entire family sets of arguments to be public? I don't want every time my family has a fight or my family to go to court to go in there and, you know, fight about it. You know, I, I don't want the court to see it. I don't want my neighbors to be able to walk in and listen to them argue, nor do I want them to know my finances. And you lose control. Yeah. This is a well, and you're, if you, it's not even you lose control. You've lost all control now. Yeah. You basically have no power to act. And it may not even be a family member who's appointed to make those decisions. It may not be the person you want. In cases where there's infighting or there's disagreements, the court appoints a third party neutral. That's basically going to be a local attorney who's agreed to take appointments, who's now going to be in charge of making your medical decisions, your financial decisions, your living situation. Do you want someone who's never met you and now that you're, in, you're legally declared incapacitated so they may not be able to communicate with you to now make all of your decisions for you? I don't. I like to be in control. So I would do everything I could to avoid those things first. If it becomes necessary, then yes, we can go forward and we do them, but it's got to be necessary. You know, we want to deal with the least restrictive means. And in fact, Connecticut by statute now talks about that. We want the least restrictive method. You know, in dealing with special needs children today, there, there's a new national movement uh, called supported decision-making where we're focusing on what individuals can do and then working to assist them in things that they can't do. And we need to do that for seniors too. You know, that should be our plan. Like the supported decision-making movement shouldn't just be limited to children. The reality should be, we should be working to support people and what they can do and helping them in ways that they can't so that they can make the decisions for themselves. So they have some autonomy and powers of attorney and advanced directives do more for the supported decision-making idea because you have that person that can help pay your bills, but they don't overrule you. Whereas with going to conservatorship level, we're taking away your rights. We're basically saying, hey, you cannot do this again. Now, can your rights ever be restored? Yes, 
but even if rights are restored and yeah, you know, that's a, a whole other issue. There's still long-term restrictions that'll apply. There's still things you can never do again, or you might not be able to do for at least 10 to 15 years after for certain types of licenses. So, you know, we want to go with the supported decision-making and the least restrictive route by statute. And that's usually starting with a power of attorney if the person can do one and an advanced directive. If we need to go through a guardianship you know, for a child, we do it. If we need to go through a conservatorship for an adult, we do it. But again, it's about need. You know, it's, are there least restrictive methods we can utilize first? Are there other things we can do? You know, more often than not, you'll see more guardianships for children today than you will for see conservatorships for adults if the adult has done planning. And that's essentially what we were trying to get to in Connecticut. Thank you. Hey, Bev, you know, I, I never like to let an acronym go unchallenged. So um, we, we, one of the things I always say to caregivers when they, you know, first become caregivers or they're wondering where they get to support, I always say the AAA or the ADRC are your gateway, you know, in your community. There's 657 or so uh, area agencies around the country covering every county. And obviously uh, you guys have been do, doing a wonderful work in uh, South Central Connecticut. Um, th and then there's the elder helpline, people call in. So, you know, it, 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 with the area agents in aging, if they don't uh, know the answer, they'll find the answer, or they'll know someone who has the answer. But I'm also finding some incredibly interesting programs being run and tested and piloted through uh, their, their agency. And one that's actually piloting here in a few other states, I, I mean, I've been meaning to ask you about, I love the name, so I need to uh, understand what it means. Uh, ride Chaperones? Yes, it, it, it is. Not everybody realizes that the agencies on aging, in addition to funding community programs and being an answer line, uh, many of the agencies on aging actually operate their own direct service programs. And in the South Central region, we are quite committed to expanding that. So one of the uh, places that we expanded into this year is uh, to provide this uh, chaperone, Trusted Ride Chaperone. That's the name of the program. It's a Trusted and, Ride Chaperone. And, and what we are attempting- I was close. To do, yeah, you're, you were, you got the important word, you know, the chaperone. Uh, but what we're trying to do is avoid the situation where an individual, an, an older adult, goes to a medical appointment alone and gets lost. And, and, and if I could just take a minute and share a story with you as to how this got started. Uh, the, the fellow who developed this program, um, a man named Alan Lopatin, he's from New Haven um, and he lives for the last 50 years down in DC, but his mom still lives, lived here in New Haven. So he was in that long distance caregiver kind of situation, very active, mom in really good shape. She had just recently, she was in her 80s, but she had just recently given up the driving because vision was an issue, but she could get around well. So he made arrangements for transportation for her, for her medical appointments. She got picked up. She got taken to this appointment for, it was nothing serious. It was just for an x-ray. Um, and she, the transportation dropped her off at the building. And if you know our area, and I'm sure it's true in every metropolitan area, um, hospitals take up multiple blocks. They, their campuses are huge. So she got dropped off and the guy said, when you're done, have them call me and I'll come back and get you. And she walks in the building to discover, oh, they've dropped her off in the wrong place. Yes, this is an x-ray place, but she needed to be in the x-ray place three blocks over that way. And being like an awful lot of people in that age group, doesn't like to be late, wants to be on time, you know, 10 minutes early is better than one minute late. And so she's starting to feel the pressure of, oh, I've got to get to my appointment. But she doesn't know exactly where she's going. She's all alone. She's trying to master that. And although she was in pretty good shape, she still was an old woman in her 80s, you know. And with all that pressure and tension and trying to figure it out, you can't just cut through buildings. You've got to have ID and passes and so on. So 
by the time she got three quarters of the way there, uh, she was feeling very overwhelmed, very nervous, wasn't sure where she was going, all alone, frightened out there. And um, she fainted for want of a better word. No one knows exactly what happened, but she was overstressed and she fainted. She fell and when she fell, she broke her hip. So she broke her hip, she went into the hospital. Then after the hospital, she was all alone here in New Haven. She went to a rehab facility for rehab, presumably to go home. But as happens sometimes in facilities, she developed an infection and the infection prevented the healing from happening. And she ended up dying. And Alan was devastated that for the want of someone to be with her to say, Sylvia, don't worry, you sit here. I'll go get a wheelchair. We'll you know, work you over. That just being alone out there, that's really what killed her. So he was determined to come up with some way to avoid this. He came up with this idea of volunteer chaperones. And he looked for a few places to test them out. And we were fortunate to be selected as a, a beta site for this program. And what we do is we recruited a team of volunteers who we background checked and trained and did all sorts of stuff with them. And we in New Haven, um, when you call us, if you need a ride, we'll get the ride for you. But most of the people who call us don't need a ride. What they need is someone to come with them. Because I remember as a caregiver, okay, I didn't need anyone. I, 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 I can drive, I've got the car, I've got my husband, I've got my mother, whatever, whoever I was taking that day. And then you get to the facility you got to go park the car. Okay, where do I park the car? Uh, so we have these big garage in New Haven attached to the hospital. Do I drop my husband off and leave him in the lobby here, drive to the parking lot, park the car, get back, get him, and then get him to the part of the building where he needs to go for an appointment? Do I take him with me to the parking lot, leave him in the parking lot, run and go find a wheelchair? There's no good choices. You're always ending up leaving someone alone and trying to figure out what to do. With the companion, the companion is not your driver. If we make a ride for you, if we provide the transportation, that is not the companion. The companion has one purpose and that's just sit there with that older adult and provide chaperone and companionship to them and help them answer questions and stay there. We start it before the appointment. You get your appointment, you call us. We find out, do you need medical transportation? We'll arrange that. And here's the companion. We'll call you a couple of times before the appointment to make sure you're clear. Like, are you supposed to be fasting for this thing? Do, do you have your list of medications they want to see when you come in? And we run through all that with them. Day of the appointment, we go to your house and we're there. And now your transportation arrives. You and I get in and off we go. And we uh, go to the appointment together. And I stay with you and I take you home and I make sure you get in the house. Uh, we have a lot of very good medical transportation in Connecticut, but it's curb to curb. And for so many people, the front door of their living room down to the curb is hard for them to do on their own, particularly if they happen to have a walker or a cane they're trying to manipulate to. So we're walking you right out, we're taking you, we're getting in the transportation and we're going together like friends. And I'm just there to be a support for you. And we believe that it is going to make a big difference in people's lives. We had the wonderful opportunity to kind of shift the program a little during this COVID year. And we specialized in taking people for their vaccines because you remember when the, the VAMS website went up and crashed down and it was a nightmare for older adults without technology. So we would call, make the appointment for you, remind you of the appointment, come there, go with you, make sure you got the appointment, call you the next day and say, how are you feeling? Did you have any reaction? So I think it's a wonderful program. I believe you'll see the program nationally very soon. Um, I think the agencies on aging are a wonderful host site for this program. And I think we're gonna have very, very good results. So I, I strongly encourage anyone in the South Central region if you have a relative that you're caring for who needs to go to an appointment, whether it's because you're a long distance caregiver and you can't go with them, or like much more like most of our caregivers, you're a working caregiver 
and you've arranged the ride for mom, but you want that extra um, uh, set of eyes and hands, call us and we will arrange for a volunteer at no cost to you to go with your mom and make sure they get to the appointment, through the appointment and safely home. What, so what we're very, they, very excited about it. What number do they call and what do they ask for? Um, okay, so they can, we have two numbers. We have our, our direct line to the agency, which is 203-785-8533. And when they call, they would just say that they want the uh, chaperone program and they would get sent off to the right person. Um, we also have an 800 number, which God, will I remember it? 800. Hey, Sue, do you remember our number? I can look it up and I can put it in the chat. Yes. Thank you. And so then much. also Brilliant. people are asking what towns does this program cover in our region? So currently we cover the 20 towns of South Central Connecticut, which is New Haven and the havens around us up to uh, Meriden, Wallingford and um, uh, over to the Valley. In the Valley, we are not providing rides. We don't have anyone to do the rides, but we can provide the chaperones uh, and we can help you figure out a uh, ride situation. But all the other towns, we can actually send out our own uh, volunteers who do drive. So we have volunteer drivers, we have volunteer chaperones. Um, but I think in a pretty short amount of time, you'll see many other of the uh, areas of Connecticut offer the program as well. It, it does seem like with the, the focus on uh, the needs of seniors, which is really a long story, but uh, been uh, accentuated due, due to uh, what we're all going through as caregivers. We're all caregivers now. We all now know what we go through as, as caregivers because of this, this last year. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of these large chasms, these large holes in services that no one knew how to fix that people like, like this gentleman, I, need, I want to interview him, uh, have come up with and partnering with local organizations to be able to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future, these these holes in the system. And this is, I just heard about this. I thought this is one of the most interesting ones and I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing this. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Hey, Allie, I love Allie. Yes. Um, talk to me about the respite that Adult Day um, provides, what people, uh, what holds them back from thinking about adult day and what the value proposition is. Right. So like the Agency on Aging, like Beverly had said er earlier, you know, helps can um, provide that funding for individuals to come um, to our adult day program um, for the day. Um, you know, right now we're operating Monday through Friday. So those services can help fund somebody to attend our program through respite. Um, and when they come, we're really, you know, people do hold back a little bit because unfortunately, um, because of the, the fear of the loved one, right? Um, and they might be really fighting back about it. There's so many funding sources, however, um, and adult days are truly very affordable um, for the most part, if you compare it to in-home services, um, you know, the caregiver in the home, long-term long skilled nursing, um, so again, respite's another way to help pay for those services. Um, the agency on aging helps greatly. The veteran assistant program also, there's so many different funding sources, right. That can help you with adult day. Um, but the absolute growth, I think you could say that an individual gets from attending our program. Um, you know, they are not only getting mental stimulation, they're also getting the physical stimulation as well. They're getting some medical um, from a nurse as well, whether it be medication um, management. Um, we provide the physical exercise there. Um, we're meeting people really where they're at, right? And going from there, that's that individualized care um, for those individuals and doing programs that they really enjoy doing. Um, there's a variety of programs, right? Um, it's just providing that environment and especially with COVID throughout this last year, right? The social isolation was a huge part. Um, we're starting to see those individuals, a lot of the caregivers, right? Back to work. Um, and, you know, they've been with their loved one now for almost 
almost two years sitting at home. Now, now they're getting a lot of pushback, right? They don't, their family member does not want to leave the house. Um, I'm not going, I don't need to be, you know, I've been home this whole time. I don't, you go to work, I'm fine. Right. Um, and again, like we had said, there's no easy way to try to convince them. Right. So it's just taking it little by little, um, even starting off a day, right. And then trying to work your way from there. Um, having set days, right. That maybe that individual wants to come try it out. Um, I can't stress enough, truly just from the stories and the things that I have, you know, personally seen in our day center, um, and just seeing, how one person can go from being so resistant and, you know, resilient to the program, not wanting to come to, like we had said, telling their loved one, okay, go, I'll, I'll see you later. Um, and some people don't believe it at first, right? They're like, I just don't see my loved one turning this around. I don't see my loved one um, ever truly giving into the program. It's, it's just not going to work. It, it's more fight than it's worth. And I just really stress that the, to give it time, right? we have somebody now that's only comes twice a week and it's been a month now, the beginning, it was, it was very, very traumatizing and hard for the family alone. And truly the, the guy had a lot of anxiety, right? He has now just totally flourished. They said his attitude at home is different, right? He, he feels like when he goes, you know, he's going to see his friend group. He's just going to go hang out and play some cards. Um, but I stress that, it, you know, it, it can take time, but that's what we're here for as well. You know, we truly just meet these individuals where they're at. Um, and it's really on a, a personal level that we get to know these individuals and the family. And um, it, it truly is an amazing program. Yeah, no, it, it really is. It's a, it's a structured involvement. So they're not just thrown in a room and told to go take a nap. You structure right. it to help our, like you say, meet our loved ones where they are and maybe help them, uh, uh, propel them a, 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 a bit to where they, where they, where they could be. It's, we um, can't ignore the socialization aspect. Yeah, I, I think that's the one, you know, nobody wants to go into a facility, but sometimes the going into a facility or going to adult day is the better solution because they miss that socialization when they're home with that isolation is a really big problem where we we're, and we're seeing as we come out of COVID, as we, you know, we're calling it the endemic or we hope endemic. Um, yeah. As we're coming out from this, we're seeing a lot of people who have isolated for such a long period of time that it's going, it not only does it impact their social skills, but it's having an impact on memory on function on just handling day-to-day -day activities that they haven't done in so long. And the long-term impact of that is going to be huge. I mean, you know, whether it's going to lead to earlier onset dementia cases or some greater amounts of dementia cases, I don't know. But there's going to be some really, you know, I know they're studying this already at Yale, but where is this going to go? Yeah, and that's a really important question. So, you know, I think going to adult day, getting those activities, it's more than just helping us as caregivers. It helps the individual. You need that socialization. You need that help. Well, it's, it's interesting to me because caregivers make so many sacrifices on behalf of the people they care for. And, you know, maybe I'm giving up work. I'm giving up my friends. I'm staying home. I'm taking care of mom. I'm there 24 seven. I'm, you know, shouldering this burden without looking at from mom's perspective. All I got is you 24 hours a day. I don't have contact with anyone else in the world. I just hear your voice. We do everything your way. And adult daycare offers the opportunity for that separation so that you can go out and into the world and interact with other people, usually in, in your own age group. When you come back home, the, the person who's the care recipient has something to talk about, something to share, another perspective. The caregiver has gotten a little break. You're not quite so sick of each other. And maybe this terrific sacrifice that the caregivers make to do 24 seven at home, just me with mom, uh, maybe they're not necessarily helping mom as much as they might if they would allow a little break. And, and I remember these two women, oh my goodness, um, mother and daughter. And I, I don't know, I think the mother must've been 18 when she had her. They, they, they were not 20 years between them. They were both older women. Um, when the caregiver was caring for her elderly mom. And the mother said, 
Sometimes she drives me crazy. I hear her voice constantly. Hmm. And this poor caregiver was making this huge sacrifice of her life. But, but maybe sometimes it's better to also bring in just some fresh blood, you know, yeah. to kind of stimulate things a little bit. Oh, they have their place oh. to go. Yeah. I, I always tell caregivers, you know, sometimes they want you out of their face too. Yes. <laughs> well, and I'll see that it's just, you know, if I tell do. my dad that something over and over again, he's going to ignore me. Mm-hmm. But then because he lives with me, so I see him every day. But then my sister got, gives him a call and she says the same thing. <gasps> Your sister says, I got to do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been saying this for six months, dad. You, know, you, you don't understand your sister. It said, I, 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 OK, cool. Fresh face. <laughs> it's the fresh face, the fresh voice. It, it's you know, there's that difference in hearing from a different person. There, there's all sorts of things that occur that just, you know, it's always good to get that fresh response and take it that way. Um, so I, I definitely would, you know, I like adult day for that and, you know, getting a different caregiver in and, and we can't be effective caregivers if we don't take care of ourselves a little bit anyway. So it's a combination of things that we have to do. We have to take care of ourselves mm-hmm. to take care of someone else. You know, so, I, uh, yeah. I, go, go, go ahead. Alex. That just, I truly stress that as well. Like, you know, that is such an important part. And you're also giving your loved one, like the chance again, to be a part of something, right? That it's always nice to want to, that, to feel like you're a part of something within your community, right? You're getting out of the house um, and you're going to your own thing, you know, that your, your daughter, your son or your caregiver, you know, they're not a part of. And so it truly gives them something to go home and talk about um, and really relieves that stress of the caregiver. Yeah, it's so- that's. That's true too. It gives them. I know that happened with Graham. He has stories to had stories to tell my mom that my mom wasn't involved in. He can he can communicate with her on on something as opposed to just be with her all day. Absolutely, that sense of purpose again. Not- Allie, we have a question for you. Um, my parents live in Florida. My dad is ninety and cared for by my eighty-seven year old frail mother. Dementia has started. They are spending $5,000 a month for partial care in the home, Monday through Friday. They are financially stable, but to continue at this rate will be hard. My mother needs help. Can they use adult daycare if they have money and can't spend it all on care? Absolutely. So an adult day center, again, the agency on aging funds our program here in new haven i know that you said that you're from florida um but the adult day centers that you should reach out to in your area as well can help provide it, it's and again would be such a cost effective way um even if you're financially stable i can almost guarantee you that they that the a rate that they would offer you for private pay will be so significantly less expensive um than that caregiver in the home uh, Monday through Friday, um, at probably a fraction of the cost. If if they wouldn't mind popping in where in Florida they are, uh, we can get them connected with the area agents on aging in their community. Another thing we didn't mention about adult day that we use a lot um, for uh, clients with is the medical model adult day can also provide personal care um, bathing is, is really the, the big one. So, you know, you got mom and, and dad at home and you're trying to bathe them in the shower and it's a risky proposition. It's just you trying to do it when they go to the adult day. And if they sign up for that medical model and use that service, uh, you've got professionals in an, an equipped bathroom that's prepared for handicap accessibility it's a safer proposition. They're not going to be dropping your mother in the bathroom the way you might accidentally do. And just that alone um, takes such a burden off the family because that's one of the big things that caregivers talk about is trying to bathe someone. You know, And again, if you're the, the daughter and you're 75 and mom is 95, it is not an easy proposition for you to be bathing your mother or bathing your father. So... Um, that, and then you, you don't have to do the, ba- the bathing fight. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Exactly. Oh, God. And then everybody talks about you if your mom or dad isn't clean, like, oh, what a terrible caregiver you are. But 
how do you, you know, whereas I find in the adult day, they, it just becomes part of, oh, it's my turn next. It's part of the process. It happens and it, it makes yeah. life easier for both. Uh, I'm going to tell you another quick story about uh, adult day. I keynoted an event in um, Houston. So it's a huge organization that had, um, I guess like Mary Wade actually had a adult day, had in-home living and and they were wonderful and it was a it was a fun it was their gala it was a fun event and uh after the event uh, they asked if i wanted to go see an adult day center that they ran said, yeah me adult day sure absolutely and uh i i went in and everybody was sweet and wonderful they were sitting around these uh bench tables and and uh, i noticed there was a piano and there was a trumpet and there was a cassinets and there were and i said do they play music? No, 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 nobody plays music. And I went out because I was in the office. I went out and said, anybody here know how to play music? Everybody played something. <laughs> they played some ragtime from the 40s. And we had the best afternoon, you know, because it just opened them up to to remember, you know, the, 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 the fun times in their life. And the guy got up, the, the woman who ran the center said, I had no idea this equipment was just here. So it is a community. It is a, a definite community that, that they create outside of your life with them, which is great. So. Hey, Stephen, let me ask you one more quick thing. Sure. About, excuse me. My boss. My boss is not getting the attention he so rightfully demands. That's okay. <laughs> Mine is uh, bossing around my dad today. So. Oh, well, that, that's that's. <laughs> He said um, she's made her take him out six times this morning. So she's on <laughs> schedule. What do you want people to know about the relationship they should have with uh, an appropriate attorney, that attorney, uh, patient, the attorney, loved one relationship? I think the big thing, especially with the way our firm does it, is we're there. You know, it's not a transaction for us. Most of our clients are, are you know, we see them all the time. We actually have you know, our law firm structured differently than traditional law firms. Um, we kind of build it in our the way we would want it to be. So like I have social workers on staff. Um, so we're going out to people's houses. We're doing assessments. We're making those appointments sometimes for people if their kids aren't local and helping them get to those doctor's appointments. So it, the relationship and what you want it to become is based on what the firm's goal is. And you have to find a firm that's philosophy fits yours. And then for a lot of our clients, you know, we'll talk to them. I have some clients who email me every morning. Yeah, you know, I, I just got one in a few minutes ago that said, just so you know, I'm still alive. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and I get them every single day from this client. Um, you know, and it, you know, we have that relationship with them. It's what we wanted because we're client centered and how we focus on things. It's not focused on, Hey, you need a will or you need a trust. It's, you know, figure out some goals. Let's figure out what your goals are. What do you want to have accomplished? And then we figure out the document second, because anything you do in any sort of plan, any relationship in this area, it's got to be goal-based. You know, when people come in saying, I need something, that's usually the worst idea in the world. Yeah, you know, I don't go to my doctor and say, I know I need surgery on this. I go to my doctor saying, hey, this is wrong. I'd like it to be better. What can we do? So that's what we really need to focus on is what are our goals is what are we trying to accomplish and go from there it's a partnership yeah. you know um we when there was a day where we used to go around and be in rooms with caregivers at conferences and we'll get back to that but this this is wonderful but but i also i won't do it here but i would ask um how many people have advanced directives for the loved one over the years and the numbers went from, you know, probably 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 percent over the 20 years. But then I'd ask, well, how many have it for yourself? And that number is a lagging indicator that is always down around 20, 30 yep. percent. I think it's so important for us. So many people uh, depend on us, our, our kids, our parents, our our you know, our family members, our employees, our employers, um, that we take ourselves out of the circle of care. And one thing that we don't do, I think, I mean, maybe you have a, a comment about this, 
is when, when we do make sure our loved one, hopefully uh, you're doing it when your loved one's uh, able to respond and get the, have the, the cognizant and have all the, uh, the responses they need on paper so they feel better, but then you don't do it for yourself. That's kind of a question. <laughs> well, I mean, well, but it's accurate. Most people don't do that. There, so there's was a study done in Connecticut a few years ago, and it was about 40% cross the board actually had documents. You know, and, and we don't take care of ourselves as caregivers. And a lot of times we don't do anything until there's an emergency. And I get it. It's the easiest thing to avoid is doing any of this stuff. The reality is who wants to think about the fact that I might get sick tomorrow or I might die. You don't want to have those thoughts. On the other hand, you know, not having a plan is actually a plan. It's not a good plan necessarily, but it's a plan. You know, it's just a plan for a mess. You're just walking yourself and setting your family and everyone else up for a messy situation, but it's still a plan. You know, so it, it, the end of it is we need to have a plan that's going to work. And planning is really about peace of mind. And for most of us, we get peace of mind from remaining in control. Yeah, I did my own plan, not because I was concerned I would die tomorrow, but because I know one day I will get sick or something might happen. So I'm a control freak. I like to be in charge. That's why I own a law firm. Um, yeah, I have to be the boss of everything, despite my staff telling me that I have no say on anything. So if I'm they're, in charge- They're probably right. Most likely. <laughs> um, but if I'm in charge of things, then I want to make sure my plan keeps me in control. So what is my plan going to do? Well, it's going to, first, it's going to name the people that I want making my medical decisions because I'm in charge. There are people that are going to understand my values that I've already talked to about it with. You know, and that's a big part. You got to have that conversation. You want to have that conversation with the person because what's going on? The second part of that conversation, though, is you know, if you don't know what the person's wishes are, in the end, you probably do. You know, most people have given us the answer without giving us the answer. You know, you, you, you had that neighbor down the street that got sick, you know, and you're, you're taking care of your parents now and you can remember back and, you know, mom would go, oh my God, I can't, you know, she's not doing well at home and she's had a fall and I can't believe her kids are letting her go through all that. You have your answer. You just don't know you were getting it at the time. You know, so it's understanding those values and having that conversation. But if you didn't have it, you know, trying to remember those things and what happened, because it's really useful to understand what the changes were and what the people's goals were. And then as we move on from it, you know, it's, I have the person I'm in, who's in charge of making financial decisions. And it, you know, in my case, they have to do everything for my dog. Um, I, I didn't care if they paid my bills. I just wanted her vet bills paid and her food ordered. Um, that was my number one and two goals, but I made it. There you go. <laughs> Got to take care of your pets. But, and it's actually a thing you know, people don't understand this, but a traditional power of attorney doesn't allow for that. I actually had a draft language to make that work because that was my goal. So I customized my document to fit my goal. And now I'm in charge. I've maintained my control. It'll go where I want in the end of time. It'll go, you know, when I pass away, my money will go how I want it to. During my lifetime, it'll be spent how I want it to. Yep. And we'll, that's what the goal is. So like that German shepherd in California who was left $54 million, uh, your dog will have run of the house. Pretty much. She, I mean, I, I made her a beneficiary of my estate when I die. Well, you know, it's just off topic, I guess, maybe, but there are pet trusts. Yeah. Connecticut actually has a statute allowing for pet trusts now. So how do, you, it's how, on, do you, how do you get that? When we draft an estate plan for people, we'll put money into a trust for a pet. And usually there's, you, know, you have someone who's a caretaker for the animal, but you have someone else who's in charge of the finances and we can control distributions, make sure that the animal's taken care of. And you know, usually it's multiple animals in some cases. And when the last one to pass away occurs, the money can be distributed out wherever the person wanted, whether it's to family members, to a charity for animals, it, it, you know, it's whatever they want. So it's just a part of planning. It's again, going back to your goals. What's your goal? My goal is to take care of my dog. 
Yeah, it's your goal. My, yeah, she my, needs to be spoiled. My, my editor has a, a beautiful bird, a big uh, uh, parrot that will outlive all of us. You know, she's got another 60 years on her possibly. So uh, it's, it's a serious conversation. Well, what am I going to do? I want to make sure she's cared for after, after I'm gone. So um, these, these are things you need to know about. These are, this is why you need professionals to step in and, and, and support you. I've been doing contract design work, new product development for about 25 years. Um, I grew up in a little town in upstate New York. My dad was a tool and die maker, and I, I grew up watching him build things, pretty much anything he could think up, um, he could build, and I was always amazed by that. So then I got into drafting and then uh, started my own company um, doing, I started with house plans and then all kinds of widgets, inventions, uh, uh, had some successes, some failures, but I built a, a, a neat little process now um, that um, I use to, to help people uh, bring their products to market. And um, this very interesting and relevant product uh, came my way a couple few years ago uh, from a caregiver who was injured uh, caring for her husband. Uh, she sustained some serious shoulder damage um, and rotator cuff, uh, you know, shoulder replacement, all that nice stuff um uh, moving uh, her husband around um her husband by the way also felt very very guilty uh because of uh, the pain and effort that she went through so she ran to an associate of mine one of my uh, development partners and um they actually built a, a a prototype of this device in in secret so she couldn't she couldn't find a transport chair that was powered they basically didn't exist you could find a a powered wheelchair that the, the rider would control, but nothing for caregivers. Uh, so uh, she became very frustrated, again, contacted my associate and um, he built her a, a prototype, one of the first prototypes. And then they brought it to me and asked me uh, to, um, to help them bring it to market. So uh, we filed patents, et cetera. And then I've, I've worked um, on, on many production jobs and, and product launches. So I've kind of took everything together there. And one of the most important things as Gary noted there is um, the, the difference between successful products and, and failure products is, is asking the market what they want. You know, most, a lot of inventors would come to me with their great idea, but um, you know, I'd, we'd build them their prototype and they'd be the only ones that buy it because they never bothered to ask anybody, uh, hey, you know, what, what do you want? Or will you, you know, what do you need? So um, my little business model here is very opposite. So the first thing I do when an inventor comes in, I don't trust a word they say because they're married to the idea. And I, I ask, uh, you know, I ask the, 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 the consumers of the market, uh, what they need. So um, Gary Bark came on the radar pretty early on and, um, and we've been working with uh, the caregiver group here um, ever since um, this, this product uh, became transitioned from alpha stage to beta stage, which we're in right now. So we're, um, we've taken you know, a year or two of input from the caregiver community, put it into the features of this product and um, and it's it's gotten really excited. It's really gotten personally exciting for me too um, to be part of this as well because I could I could design I could you know work on all kinds of projects. I could, could kind of get to pick and choose. I prefer to work on things that matter and um, and and that you know can help the world be a better place. And this is uh, the, the the top of the list. I put all my other projects on hold and I've just been uh, driving this one. So um, I'm going to give you a quick little. Uh, uh, introduction to the product, and, and I, again, I'm going to ask for some feedback uh, from from the audience here. Uh, so I'm going to show you the problem, show you some of the features that we've got in, into the um, built into the product now, and then we're going to do a, a quick uh, survey for uh, that that'll go out to you guys live here uh, to just help guide us into the importance of some of the the features here that we've been uh, designing into the, the, the device here. So um, hang on here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a screen and then press play and hopefully everything will go smoothly here. So here we go. There's a, a look at the, the pain there. 
If you're like most caregivers, you find pushing a traditional chair uphill or across rugged terrain difficult, trying, and sometimes downright impossible, getting you nowhere fast. At times, it's like you have square wheels. Stop pushing and start giving with Power Drive. What if there were a way to effortlessly escort a chair up a hill? With Power Drive, you can. The secret is the Power Drive unit. Created for caregivers, the light and portable Power Drive attaches to the back of the chair, engaging the wheels with one easy to push lever. Once attached, you can use the color-coded buttons on the handle to help move forward and reverse. With precision, variable speed control, push a button and whoosh, off you go. Using just Oops, sorry about that. one finger, hills, power drive, grassy fields, power drive, rough terrain, yep, you guessed it, power drive. Stop struggling to get your loved ones around and start living again with power drive. Built for caregivers. Built for you. If you're like most. All right, there's our, our little award there and uh, one of the, the renderings now that uh, is showing the finished product. And here are the features um, I was mentioning here. So um, what we've done is, is one of the major uh, issues is the weight of these, of these transport chairs and then add a motor, boom, you're doubling the weight. So what we have done is um, we've minimized, we've separated the power system from the chair. So, um, and we've also utilized a very, one of the lightest transport chairs on the market. Uh, so it's all aluminum. So 20 pounds is the limit. Uh, that people have been um, telling us, you know, heavier than 20 pounds. So you, you're able to take the unit apart and that's what makes it lightweight. So you can fold it up, put it in the trunk, back seat, and then um, in, in a modular fashion. Uh, so so uh, again, I'll just go down the list here quickly. Um, so basically you, you unfold a standard transport chair. You want to use something that everyone was used to. And, um, and again, this module is detachable. And then we have a, the controller is a hand grip controller just for uh, the caregivers. Um, so it's, it's, it's much safer, obviously, than um, patients uh, with uh, Alzheimer's dementia, um, you know, powering and maneuvering a joystick controlled uh, wheelchair around, which uh, there's a lot of safety issues and, um, and injuries that are uh, related to that. So there is, you know, foldable lightweight um, and the hand grip controller and some safety mechanisms. Some of the feedback we got from caregivers, uh, they're very frustrated with these foot rests that flop around. So we're putting special grips on ours. Um, the, again, the safety, what happens if you let go and, you know, can it roll? No, it's got a, a, a safe, smart brake system uh, that, that we've included and then stabilizer bars. That was, it's all caregiver feedback that we got. The wheels, you know, something uh, that can get into the grass and off-road a little bit. We have a question from one of our panelists. Um, can you control the speed of the uh, wheelchair going down the hill? Yeah, so the, uh, again, back to caregiver um, input, uh, keeping it very simple, um, the control panel, we have a, a, a preset speed. So the, the caregiver can select a speed and that's the, the maximum speed that it'll go. So if you want a little quicker pace, you can go uh, press towards the bunny rabbit side of the button. If you want to go a little slower, you press towards the, the turtle side and it goes slower, uh, a little light indicators. But then as, yes, as it was to go down a hill, uh, the computer will actually regulate the speed. So it'll maintain that speed uphill as well. So that's a, that's a great question. And that's something we're, we're addressing. We're, we're actually working on that right now with the software developers and we're testing that now. Um, and then the other, the fail safe. So we say you are going down a hill and uh, the caregiver, you know, God forbid trips and falls and loses uh, contact with the grip. So what we're putting on the hand grip is that an infrared sensor, actually dual sensors that'll, that'll sense if there's a human hand uh, grasping the handle. So if, if the caregiver was to let go, 
uh, the computer will know to, to slow down, not just jam on the brakes. We get to regulate that through the software and then bring it to a graceful stop. And then it'll engage a, a parking brake, a fail safe parking brake as well. So there's um, actually some nice redundancy that we're, we're bringing into it. So if uh, catastrophic, you know, it goes underwater or just something, you know, catastrophic happens, it'll fail in a stopped state. It'll mechanically fail stopped. So, so good stuff. Thank you for that. By the way, just in time for holidays, uh, holiday fearless caregiver guide, lessons learned about how to survive the holiday as a family caregiver, you get it on uh, caregiver.com. But uh, we have a, a whole whole set of them, um, uh, how to get friends and family members to help, um, Alzheimer's caregiving, uh, respite caregiving, and holiday caregiving. <laughs> It was just thrown in my hands. <laughs> Hot off the presses. So uh, again, amazing, fantastic, incredible, um, spectacular uh, set of panels who are going to talk about things. I always love when caregivers come and learn um, the services and phrases and, uh, and technology that they never knew before. For example, we have a VA caregiver coordinator here. We have the Connecticut Ombudsman. We have uh, a leading light from the Connecticut Alzheimer's Association. And we have the author of Sudden Death Checklist from suddendeathchecklist.com. So um, let, me, let me start, uh, have you guys just uh, go around and introduce yourself. Mairead, let's start with you. Sure. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mairead Painter. I am the state long-term care ombudsman. Most people don't know what a long-term care ombudsman is until they need one. So individuals from my office represent the rights of residents in nursing homes, residential care homes, and assisted living communities here in Connecticut, also known mm -hmm. as residential communities. Um, I work at a state and federal level on legislation and ensuring that people have informed choice. Uh, for least restrictive environment and to receive their long-term services and supports um, in a quality way, in a way that they direct. So thank you for having me. One of those incredibly important um, uh, uh, professionals in a community that people don't necessarily always know is there. So thank you for being here and sharing the work of the Ombudsman. So Bonnie. Oh. Yeah, I'm Bonnie Ciccarelli. I'm the Caregiver Support Program Manager for VA Connecticut. Uh, we have a wide variety of services. We have support groups, um, and we also have a program that a lot of people are interested in. It's a stipend program that provides a stipend to a caregiver of a family member or someone that you live with. So we have, we're rapidly expanding, and um, we have a lot to offer for veterans and caregivers. And Maria, hello. Hi, uh, my name is Maria Tomasetti, and I'm with um, I'm the South Central Connecticut Programs Director with the Alzheimer's Association. I've worked with the association for 15 years, um, starting on our 24/7 helpline. Uh, we provide um, information, education, and support related to Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia for caregivers, for people with a diagnosis, an early diagnosis in particular, and professionals. And I was also the primary caregiver for both of my parents who had Alzheimer's type uh, dementia for many years. So thanks for this opportunity and welcome everyone. Thank you. And Jack. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy holidays. Uh, my name is Jack Vale and I've lived in Connecticut now for 30 years. I'm a family business consultant that helps families, through, businesses go through their transitions. And one of the tools I use to help facilitate those meetings is the sudden death checklist that started off uh, 20 years ago as a Excel spreadsheet and a, actually a Lotus 123 spreadsheet and a word pro document and is now a book. So from three pages to 120 pages, 
there's a lot of detail and questions that, have, that come up that I try to help answer. Thank you. Dr. Kidder, did you want to join us? Oh, I saw her in, the, in here earlier. Um, so let's start, let's just jump right in. Mairead, what do you wish people knew about what the ombudsman does that if you're sitting in front of them as you are, you can tell them about? Well, that's a great question. Um, I wish people understood that we work at the direction of the resident. And so that can be challenging at times for a couple of reasons. One, if a family member calls us with a concern and addresses something, we are required by federal law to go and ask the resident if they want us to address it. If the resident says no, we are not mandated reporters. We are carved out of that law, both at a state and federal level. We cannot move forward with the case. So when you're talking about individuals who maybe have some memory care issues, even if they are conserved, um, if a regional ombudsman is going to move a case forward where a resident has directed them not to, even if they're conserved, um, it needs to come to me because there are other individuals who are mandated reporters. There are other individuals who should be moving that case forward and we are supposed to be there um, for the resident and taking direction from them. So I would say that's one of the most challenging times. And I understand when family members get frustrated and I get those calls. It's just to keep us um, in our role and facilitating what we need to do for the resident. But there are, and we will tell you um, who else can maybe help in that role aside from us. I never knew that. I'm such an advocate of, of, of uh, ombudsman programs, and I learned something. I better write that down before I forget it. That that was great, Bonnie. What do you wish people knew about what you do for them as caregivers at the VA um, that you would tell them by sitting in front of them and telling them? So our program is most popular because of the stipend program, but we have other things to offer to them. And one of the hardest things I find for our caregivers is just navigating the VA system and being aware of what we have here besides this particular program, like the Home Health Aid Homemaker Program, Adult Daycare, Veteran Self-Directed. And also, I wish they would take more advantage of the um, support groups and resources but caregivers tend to not have time for themselves to be able to do that. And it really has to come from them. Can't force anybody into a group, but it really does support them and does make them a better caregiver because they're taking care of themselves. Are you doing virtual support groups at this point? Yeah, we have a lot of them. I have a, a general caregiver support coordinator who's great. She's really implemented so many groups. Um, uh, self-care groups, VA Reach for Dementia, VA Reach for PTSD, Caregivers First, um, and she's very creative, so she thinks of more and more and more as we see needs. We even have one now uh, for veterans who are caregivers, a specific group for them, because it, it, it's odd to put them in with caregivers of veterans and a, a HIPAA thing, so we created a group for them. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Maria. Uh, yes. Yeah, so our Alzheimer's Association um, information support and education, they're for families living with any type of dementia, and that includes Alzheimer's, but not limited to Alzheimer's. Often comes up at health fairs that people didn't call because they thought that we're the Alzheimer's Association and that other types of dementia are not included under that umbrella. So that's really important. Um, it, the fact that that is not just a crisis line. Some people think it's only a number to call when they're in crisis or they have an emergency. It's a number for any type of dementia um, and any type of question. So it can be related to communicating with our loved ones, challenges with bathing, challenges with incontinence, I'm looking for a support group. I just got a diagnosis. Uh, what do we do? Where are resources? I just want to vent. So there's no question it's too big or um, too small. Um, 
and the fact that um, to Gary's question before, our services because of the pandemic, um, they largely went virtual. Um, we now in terms of our um, caregiver support groups have a combination. We have some in-person groups and many virtual groups at this point. Um, we do have early stage groups for people with an early stage diagnosis. They have gone virtual, but as soon as it's safe, they really need to go in person because they're much more effective when they are in person. And another um, best kept secret is that we have care consultations. They can be telephonic on the helpline, but they also can be virtual or in person. Some families um, request one, for example, when they're a new diagnosis and they're not sure where to go or their loved one seems to be moving into another stage or they wanna plan for another stage. Um, so um, I have one on Monday in Simsbury. So um, those are things that are open to people and our services for families are free of charge. That's good too. Okay. Jack, what do caregivers need to know about your work? Uh, the presentation that went on that this morning at, uh, earlier was a one in which uh, the, the questions came out is to how do you get people to talk with one another? And it, if you can't talk with one another, a lot of these systems don't work well. And so what I have is a tool that gets people talking. And the, the send up checklist is about, about your death or your loved one's death. And your children or, or relative is going to be your executor. And are they prepared? Are they, should these conversations be made before you die? And I've been one to pr promote the fact that business owners tend to have a tendency not to talk very well about their wealth or, or their own information. So you gotta have a tool and you have to have a system. And the way the system works is train the kids because they're going to own the, the, the checklist. And it, they can start driving change. One of the things that's really interesting uh, in the business world, there's a family council. And we have an ombudsman that, that's in this presentation here that I'm interested in listening to about the, 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 the process of having a family council to manage the process for them. I use the, man, the family council to get the families to talk with one another. We're a distant relative, black sheep, black, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call them, they, they are not part of the system, but will be by estate planning. And so how do you get that going? How do you get them talking? And there's a lot of people here in this, that are, what I've been listening to and watching to that are really good listeners and their clients need help. To, to, because if they don't talk, they don't get served. So that's what I bring to the table. Yeah, now I want to go into the checklist in particular in, in, in a little bit. Um, Marie, do you know I had the, um, well, you don't know, because I'm telling you, uh, the uh, ombudsman, uh, North Carolina ombudsman on an event uh, panel in um, Fayetteville, actually in person. And um, it, he was he was great to explain the ombudsman, but he said, you know, I have a file, um, you know, that's uh, 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 reachable by uh, people I want to know about it, and it's called the in case I disappear file. <laughs> Just in case I disappear, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to do. In many cases, you, you're right. You have the family caregiver who's concerned for their loved one who's uh, got cognitive issues in long-term care facilities, but then you have the person in the long-term care facility who actually can, um, you know, uh, make make assessments for themselves, complain for themselves. How do they reach you, and what do you hear from them? So. In those cases, we're talking about supported decision making, right? An individual who maybe they, they need some support, but we need to hear how they see their best day and how do we support them getting there um, and bringing family and friends along because everyone sometimes has their own idea about what that best day should look like. Um, how do they reach us? So my team members do quarterly unannounced visits to the long-term care communities. 
Um, we also have resident advocates who are certified and are in our long-term care communities. I could always use more. So if you know of anyone who'd like to volunteer, please um, reach out and let me know. Um, we are now allowing individuals who have loved ones in long-term care communities to volunteer, which we hadn't previously. You can't do it in the building where you have a loved one, but you can. Um, and so a lot of it is people walking around and making those connections. Um, we also have started to do a lot of outreach through commercials and um, there has to be a posting in every long-term care community. We post um, on yellow paper um, so that it kind of stands out from all the other 8,000 pieces of paper that the state uh, posts. Um, and it has our contact information and we are adding, um, I actually just wrote it down. Our team came back to me today. They want them in Creole, Spanish, um, Polish and English so that we have them more accessible um, in each home. That's, that's, that's very nice. Yeah, no, I, I find a lot, so many times the best um, solutions for family caregivers, the best uh, tools for them are really challenging. You know, ombudsman is one word, hospice is another word, palliative is another word. So the, the more we explain um, what's available to caregivers and overcome the, the, the lexicon, I think the better they are when they go, they need this kind of support, they know who to reach out to. So. And we will have one of the nation's first, it just started, um, first statewide family councils. Ah. We have a new um, a board, the statewide family council, and they will be supporting individuals whose homes don't have a family council or if they want to start a family council. And we'll be putting uh, monthly materials together. So it's kind of a grab and go idea where they could bring it back to their individual homes. And I have um, purchased with some of our um, COVID funds, a 500 person Zoom um, license that will be for family councils to sign up for. So if you have a family council and you'd like to use the Zoom, you can always um, reach out to me and uh, we'll set you up with that. And these, this statewide council, they need to be, have loved ones in facilities? Um, the board, so there, I'm supporting them and growing, but I really want them to be autonomous. So um, they're defining what that looks like for them. If someone's in, if it's a family council within the nursing home, yes, but the statewide family council, um, I want them to decide who they want on their council. Um, but we're trying to do it at that level and then have a national family council where hopefully each state will have a statewide family council and have national representation when we're talking about these national bills and things that we need to move forward, doing more with instead of for. That's fantastic. Dr. Kidda, did you have any questions? No, uh, I'm listening because um, traditionally the agencies on aging um, don't work much with people in institutional settings, except to help them get out of that. Uh, we have always been for individuals living in the community, but increasingly the lines are blurring. And so, you know, looking at um, how we work together and, and where our logical points of connection are. Um, we, we usually work with the elderly protective services folks because they're caring for the people in the community and not so much with, um, uh, Maraid. So um, I'm just trying to learn like everybody else, with, where are our connection points? What do we do? Excellent. Bonnie, talk to me about aid and attendance care. Okay, so aid and attendance is through our benefits office. My program, the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers is through the health administration. So aid and attendance has a whole separate um, application. And it's basically the, the criteria are the same. It's for a veteran who needs the aid and assistance of another person in their daily life, either for activities of daily living, or because of a cognitive impairment. So they I if I'm, if somebody's asking me about that, I direct them where to go and connect them with the veteran service officer. Oh, VSO. Okay. Uh, I it just this large pot of money that's uh, gone unclaimed because we we don't necessarily talk about it all the time. I always have VA caregiver coordinators on the on the panels, and um, uh, uh, it's just a, an eye opener for family caregivers. Right. I put in for aid and attendance for my mom because my dad was a Marine, but mm -hmm. 
the yeah. office is still closed. So I put in last July and they're, they're unless you're, it's, it's. Yeah, no, so emergency. I would have to say for our program, we try to complete applications within 90 days. Um, aid in attendance is a much longer process. So um, if I met the criteria, I would apply for my program first. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of um, a lot of um, assessments, but I think our program is clear cut. You just move through, and you have somebody there with you, walking you through the process. I think sometimes aid in attendance can be kind of evasive unless you have somebody really good working with you, following that application. So. You know, Gary, um, at our office, uh, we have a couple of programs that we uh, operate with the, the veterans uh, hospital in our community. And so we did some training for people who were interacting with the veterans. And we had people from the veteran hospital. We had people from the VA administration. We had people from the state veteran stuff. And then we had uh, soldier, sailor, and marine private, you know, monies. And we've got them all together in the room and, and they all have wonderful programs with wonderful benefits, but none of them talk to each other. None of them really know the other person's stuff. So you apply for my program, but as, as a veteran, you just want help. You don't care what program, right? but you go down whatever avenue someone pointed you to. And if the information ends right there, because, well, that's not my application, the veteran comes away feeling, oh, I'm not eligible for anything, when in fact, they might be eligible for a lot. And, and as Bonnie very politely indicated about aid and attendance, you need an advocate. You don't get you through do. that process without a knowledgeable advocate. Um, and that's one of the things that my office is working on on a small scale. And one of our <clears throat> development goals, we would like to become an information center for veterans right. who understand all of the different phases and can right. get people into whatever programs that might help them. So I encourage anyone who's in our audience uh, or has relatives who are veterans that are looking for information and help about veteran services, call our agency on aging at, because we try to make sure that we understand all of them and that we I, can- I would just like to say, uh, part of our program is helping caregiver. If you're not eligible for my program, I'm gonna provide you with all the information on aid and attendance, veteran self-directed, home health aid, homemaker, whatever we have to offer. We don't just say, sorry, see ya. I, I'm sorry if I sounded like that. It's We try to be knowledgeable about what we have here. At, I work out of West Haven VA Medical Center. So, and I, I you must be talking about the veteran self-directed program. One of the programs, yep. Yeah, so I am aware of all those and that is, so it's not just my program, it's helping caregivers navigate this crazy system, which is, and, and where to go and what branch. And so, and I do work closely with the service officers also. It's just, that's not my expertise. So I will refer them to them. And, and I think it's great when they get to you, Bonnie, oftentimes like at the hospital, they get to that little office on the first floor behind admissions and they don't end yeah. up, you know, <laughs> they don't end up to you or they don't end yeah. up at, um, you know, their local right. uh, no. VA center where maybe know. they're, you know, we're, we're working with homeless vets. We have a huge program that we fund right. for legal issues for vets because right there in your very building, people are not getting information that they need about programs for which they're eligible, or they're getting misinformation about, oh, well, because of your discharge status, you're not eligible. Well, that rule changed two years ago, but you know, no one's kept pace. So um, we are really impressed with all of the services that are available through the various veteran stuff, but the uh, misinformation is such an issue and, um, you know, if they don't get to you, they really are um, in trouble. Well, well, it is oh, a lot of people think my program is aid in attendance. And so then I, I have to like look through the records and say, oh, you didn't apply for this program. I know what you did. So it, it is overwhelming and confusing <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. When I'm a, a, a caregiver veteran 
and uh, are you the first office I walk into? And or when I walk into your office, what are you asking me? So I would ask about uh, who you're caring for, uh, what the needs of the person you're caring for, what the living situation. We would do like basically an intake. So. I would want to know like the eligibility. So for one of our programs, you have to be, the veteran needs to be 70% or more service connected and they need to have served post 9-11 or prior to May 7th, 1975. So these are things I need to know. Then I need to know clinically what, what are the needs of this person. So then I can look at the whole picture and say, yeah, this is, this program's right for you. Or I can say, I think you should try this program and give them all the information. I might even do like a warm handoff to the social worker in primary care or the nurse case manager and make sure that person gets to the next person that would be appropriate for them. You're, you're, you're an angel for caregivers is what you are. Thank you. I love caregivers. <laughs> They're wonderful people. <laughs> I've met a lot of them. So, uh, Maria, let me ask you, the, you know, you, you mentioned, um, uh, and this is just another interesting uh, point that people say, oh, it's not Alzheimer's, I can't go to you. But people are probably always asking you, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's a bigger answer than that. It, can you? Um, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, basically, um, Dementia is an umbrella term. It stands for any changes in memory, thinking, behavior, judgment, personality, navigation that impacts someone's daily life. Um, there's no one disease called dementia. Depending on what book you're looking at or doctor you're talking to, there's over 50, over 70, over 100 different types of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. You know, second most common type depending on which book you're looking at, vascular dementia um, caused by a large stroke, series of small strokes, any issue with blood flow to the brain. Another common type is uh, Lewy body dementia. And there's a category of frontal temporal disorders that are not as common, but often affect um, more younger people. So um, is that what you're looking for? Okay. Yeah, uh, and again, we, well, we get support. that question all the time, I'm sure. Yeah, we, we do. And, and but there are many people that still think that if our loved one is diagnosed with vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, um, a frontal temporal disorder, that because we're the Alzheimer's Association, that we're not going to be able to help. Our full name is actually Alzheimer's and Related Disorders Association. But that last part was chopped off somewhere along the line, which has caused great confusion. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Jack. Let's talk about the checklist in particular, how would it, how it uh, applies to family caregivers. You and I, Bev and I were talking about that, that earlier. And first of all, I think it's the best title guide. You need to win an award for that sudden death checklist. Okay, I get it. I know exactly what you're trying to tell me. Cool. But how do people use it? This is mine. And how did I get it to be filled in? I said, I told my kids, I says, I got this book that I wrote for everybody, but I'm not going to fill it in. And they said, why not? I says, because I'm going to be dead. I don't care. And, but if you're going to be my executor, you should have this book because this book is going to help you navigate through the, the emotions of suddenly die, of my sudden death, of your mother's sudden death. So all of a sudden, this conversation that nobody wants to talk about is now full circle, and they're now dealing with me. And, and so the book is not 100% because there's a lot of stuff here that doesn't apply to me. But there, you know, what I have here is something that they, can, they know where to go. If you notice, it's right there. And so I can, they know where to find it. And we talk about it at least twice a year. It's something to talk about. Okay. I, tell you, I, I uh, um, thirty years ago, last month, my dad, my dad passed, and when he took ill a year earlier, he was sixty-two, healthy, you know, no issue, and uh, all of a sudden he wasn't in control anymore of anything, and he was always in control. He had, I mean, 
I, I was, he, his kids were all grown, but you know, the, nobody knew about his uh, bank accounts. Nobody knew about his insurance. Nobody knew. And thus, uh, I felt like Indiana Jones the first six months. And that's the worst time to start digging for things like that. So as I said, what people say to me about, I wish I had today's Carrier Magazine 30 years ago, I did. But um, uh, I wish I had this in my you know, parents' house 30 years ago. Here's another thing. Bev, you, have felt, you, you, you have one of these, right? I do. So we were talking about this this morning. So what did, what did you get out of this process? Well, I, I was sharing with you. For me, at least, it started to get me a little bit organized as to what are the categories of things I need to gather together my totally all over my house uh, papers and um, to, to begin to think a little conceptually about this because as it stands now, my poor son wouldn't have a clue what to do if I dropped dead tomorrow. And there's a lot that will need to be done like on the first of the month, uh, you know, you don't want, you don't want to lose your house. You don't want to have the insurance lapse on your cottage and have a windstorm come up and blow it away. And he, he would have no idea where to get anything, where everything is, what my history is, where he doesn't even know what banks I go to, never mind having access to it. So um, it, it pushed me. I have not been completely successful, I'm not pretending by any means, but it's pushed me at least to start thinking and conceptually and organizing and, and aligning um, what I'm doing along with the chapters so that uh, it, there's some sense to, to what I'm putting together. Now, you, the, you have an executor? No. You have your, what's your son going to be? Well, by default, it's all going to fall to him. But yeah. uh, no, I, I, I have to say, you know, when I was listening this morning to our attorney, Steve Rubin, talking, you know, I promote him all the time. I haven't done any of those things. Who has time, you know? Who wants to think about it? I'm the worst example. Um, I feel like a hypocrite sometimes. Shoemaker but, has no shoes. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly right. But um, when I heard you speak last year and I saw the book, I thought to myself, at least buy the book and start forcing yourself to, to start to think that way. And so in that respect, the, the book has been helpful to me in that respect. And it also bridging the conversation with my son who whose answer for everything is, you're not gonna die, Ma, shut up. I don't wanna talk about this. You know? <laughs> so we mutually deny, you know? uh, but at least, you know, I hold a book up and I say, well, here's the book. This is where the book is like you, you know, I try to keep it really handy where all the papers are. So uh, it's a process, it's, it's a process, yes, it, deck, but it's helping. That, so, so the next step for you is to do a, a, a fire drill. And what you, do, what you do is you sit there and you say, son, I, I'm, di I'm dying today. What are you going to do? Just walk me through it. Just walk me through it, my son. Tell me what, what's gonna be next because you got to phone call people. Do you have the list? Here's the list of people I have. You need to check this list to see if I'm missing anybody. And, and so that's the interaction you're going to get because not dad, I don't want to talk about this. This is, this is too morbid. We were here for Thanksgiving. What are we really doing this? To this? I says, well, it's part of the thing that you don't want to leave your mother with a mess because there'll be a mess and you guys are going to have to deal with it. Well, it's, it's so funny that you, you selected that particular example of who you're going to call, you know, when, when the death comes. Um, in preparation for Thanksgiving, I did put a list of all the recent contacts, um, the uh, text and Facebook addresses for the people who I would want to wish Thanksgiving wishes to. Those are the same people that I would want to make sure he notifies that I died. So uh, I got that list done. And I, so when I did, I said to me, now see, this is the list you're going to use when mommy dies to invite everybody to the reception after the funeral. So this is the list. So I, I have one step accomplished. Well, you got the party going. So that's all. Yeah, that counts. what the hell? So, hey, Marie, let me, let me ask you something if I could, because uh, I'm going to go around and ask this question. So give everybody a heads up. What, what is the, 
most common without any, I guess, you know, uh, specifics of anybody's particular situation. What's the most common thing you're called in on? Depends on the, the time, but right now I would say the thing we're hearing the most is ability to have individualized needs met, which boils down to staffing issues, right? We know that staffing is challenging in um, normal times. It's incredibly challenging right now, but the root cause of the issue, right? Well, here I didn't get to the bathroom. Um, I didn't get my shower. All of the complaints that we get kind of boil down to staffing. And that's challenging because the staff are working so hard right now. And you can only get so much blood from a stone. These guys have worked for months and months and they're taking extra shifts. Um, I think it puts people at higher risk for abuse and neglect, not because the staff members have ill intentions, but they can only do so much. You can only take on so much before you start to make errors um, or work so many shifts before you're overtired. Um, and again, facing some of those challenges. So when we get things like um, neglect cases or um, staff that are normally really appropriate, their tone changes and they might be a little aggressive in their tone or snap at residents. When we really look back at the root cause, it all really at this point is relating back to staffing. So how do you, if a resident calls, can do you counsel them or? Again, we take direction from them. So we'll go and meet with them. We always wanna encourage people to self-advocate, right? Give them the tools to empower them to be as strong as possible independently. But we're there to either sit with them or sometimes they're just not willing or don't wanna take that on. And then we can help them with that. Um, sometimes they don't want us to say anything because they're afraid of retaliation. Um, and I'm not saying that retaliation always happens, but it's the lack of having control when you feel the fear of someone retaliating. Um, and so really giving residents um, strategies on how to deal with that, coming together as a resident council. So we talked a little bit about family councils, but encouraging residents, if they are fearful to come together as a resident council and put it in the resident council minutes, because that's something that the facility will have to respond to in writing, how they're gonna correct that, whether it be a staffing issue, um, quality of care. And that is something that my office and the Department of Public Health have access to and look at when we're in the building. Excellent, all right. And they know to call you because of the little, the yellow notes on the walls. That we send out magnets. Um, some people have blankets. We did blankets for over their bed. It has our number big at the bottom. And we're also starting, you're gonna see, we're copying AARP. I'm gonna put it right out there, we are. <laughs> has the sea of red every time I go somewhere to the Capitol. So my team now you'll see, um, oh wait, it's on the side, um, the ombudsman logo, and they will be wearing this color when we testify, when we do anything, when they're in the building, advocates, so that when residents see this color um, in the building, they'll know it's someone from our program and it's a little bit easier to identify. That's, that's very, very smart, yeah. Branding. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm copying AARP. I can't take credit for it. <laughs> well, they, they spent millions to get consultants to tell them that, and you just copied it. So who's smarter? Come on. <laughs> Harry, we have a couple of questions. Um, yes, Vanna, thank for, you. For Bonnie. Um, so Bonnie, uh, these questions are for you. Um, the first one is, is there a living document that overviews all of the VA options. And the second question is, I'm a caregiver of a husband, of my husband, a veteran who's 100% disabled and 100% unemployable. Would VA caregivers program or the aid and attendance program be better for him? And what is the difference? Okay, so um, the program of comprehensive assistance for family caregivers is our stipend program. In order to be eligible that, for that, as I said, 70% service connection served post 9-11 or prior to May 7th, 1975. We will be expanding to all errors in October of 2022. Um, as I said, our program is much quicker. 
However, there is a, a pretty difficult process. They have to, the veteran and caregiver have to be available for psychosocial assessments, functional assessments, intakes. So there's a lot that they have to participate in. So the service connection doesn't determine the clinical needs. So some people can be 100% service connection connected and still be able to function. So there's clinical eligibility requirements. Uh, if your husband needs help with activities of daily living, um, or if he has a, a dementia of some kind, some kind of cognitive impairment, then our program's a good one to, uh, to apply for. Aid in attendance, uh, I think is a much more difficult application to fill out because I've tried to help people with that. And it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. It talks about your finances and this and that. And so I, I, when we had more time, I would try to help people do that. But with the influx of applications, I now have to refer them to a service officer. Um, so I can't tell you which one is better. I like my program. <laughs> and I think it's a quicker turnaround time, like 90 days. We want to get that application completed and a determination met so that, you know, we're not holding people up for like a year. It's just not. And my, my way of thinking, it's not right. So, but I, I can't say, I'm not saying it, the veteran service officers, they're busy and they're getting probably they're shorthanded and it's hard to process everything. And so to, to the person's first question about, is there a living document that reviews all this? We were not able to find any one document that had information about things from the VA hospital, things from the VA administration, things from Connecticut State uh, oh, Veterans Services. Yeah. It's all over the place. So and it is. So I would go on our website, www caregiver.va.gov. It talks a lot about our services. There's also, if you Google VA geriatrics and extended care, yes. So I know where it is because it's, a, I know where to Google now. Um, I don't have one document that has everything. If I wanted to know about aid and attendance, I'd Google aid and attendance, but we do have a website with um, geriatrics and extended care services. And it talks about each one, veteran self-directed, home health aid, homemaker, adult daycare. But again, you're right. It's not like it's right there. You have to search around for it. I like the idea though, of yes, coming up with something. We also had another question. In order to be eligible for stipend as a caregiver, is this program Medicaid driven where the person being cared for has to qualify or have Medicaid or Title 19? No, absolutely not. They have to be an enrolled veteran, have a primary care team, and be 70% or more service connected um, or um, need uh, in the service areas like uh, prior to 1975 or post 9-11 right now. But it has nothing to do with Medicare. That's a whole different thing. This is through the VA. It's a VA benefit. And I shouldn't even say it's a benefit because then I'm back in the benefits office. So uh, it's a v through the healthcare system and it's a stipend provided by the treasury of the VA. Are there VA. any income limits of, for eligibility? Not, uh, no, no, none at all, thankfully. Anything else, Sue? Yes, Gary, I have more for you. Uh, oh. Take it away. If, if the panelists have not put their contact information in the chat, would you please do so? Um, and also people are asking how they can get Jack's book. And if he could put a link in the chat or um, tell them how they can order his book, that'd be great. I'm deathchecklist.com. I'll, I'll put it in the chat, but it's sundeathchecklist.com. Thank you, Jack. And that's, that's a, all that's I have for now, Gary. Okay, no problem. 
Thank you. Bonnie, I wanna ask you the same question. Well, um, what's the most common situation you see sitting across the desk from you? So what I see most commonly is people coming in wanting to know how to apply for the caregiver program. So, and so what I do is you know, tell them the eligibility requirements. I, I have sat here and helped them do the, the application online because a lot of our the clientele is now older and they don't really know how to navigate. So I've sat here with them. I'll help them fill out the application, tell them the steps. When they call me during the process, I'll tell them where the application is at because back in October, when we got slammed with like about, I think it was like 90 something applications and had three social workers and three nurses processing them all and trying to do it within 90 days, people would be calling, I'm, I'm checking on the status. And I'd be like, oh, be patient with us. We're having, and I would tell them where it was and reassure them we have it, we're working on it. So it's mostly, most of what I do is processing the applications, working with the um, veteran and caregiver on what the eligibility requirements are and what needs to happen to make the application approved. It's, it's really sad to have to tell people, I'm sorry, you weren't, you know, you didn't meet the eligibility requirements. That's something we all hate to do here. Yeah, but to have somebody guide them like that is, 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 is earth shattering. It's great. Right. And so, and when you're doing these assessments, because I still do a lot of them, you get attached to the people. All of a sudden, you know, like you might not meet our criteria, but you are a caregiver and you're doing like, and then I, I feel like I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm biased now towards them. I really want them to be on the program. And I have to tell you, my staff takes it very hard when they feel somebody should make it and they don't. We've had to process that as a team. So. Thank you. Jack, can I tell you something really quick? that? I wanted to mention my mention my brother. I wish we had that book. At the age of 63, a perfectly healthy person, he became sick and he ended up in the hospital and within six months died. He owned the family farm business and it was just like he was trying and what he had kind of affected his mind and how he kept it together to try to work out everything like who was going to do what was amazing. And I wish... We had your book. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I tell, it's, I, these are the stories that come about. And by the way, if, if you're if you're a business owner and you suddenly die and you have 85 employees, you have 85 families that have just got impacted by. And what are we going to do? You're going to lay them off? You know, how, how do we keep the business going? You know, the business and, and then, is another family. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's one of those crazy things that, uh, so it's, it is important. Um, the one thing that was, I'd like to say is that there are companies that have bought a hundred books for their, keep for their employees, because if they should suddenly die, they had a mess on their hands. They didn't want to, they now have given their children, their, their, their second children, which are the employees, they've given their second children, their stepchildren, uh, the tools that they need to make for their lives and, and, and the company's lives to be better through this. I, I appreciate it. Uh, Maria, let me ask you the same question. What's the most common situation you see when people come in and they just, I, I, I wanted to quickly tell you that when my grandfather took ill, he was you know, healthy and doing his painting contractor at a contracting at 85, never had a Day in the hospital, and uh, then, you know, just after my dad passed and his wife got ill, and he started showing signs of uh, uh, some dementia, turned out to be Alzheimer's, um, and I was I was like just started the magazine, just getting into the scenario where I'm meeting all the healthcare people in in uh, Southeast Florida, and I was told by more than one person go to the Alzheimer's Association. It was on uh, Biscayne Boulevard in, 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 in Miami. I went, I knocked on the door and uh, sat down in front of somebody who literally 
put things in perspective for me and held our my family's hand through the process, who's still a friend to, to this day, 26 years later. So my question is, what do you normally see virtually or in person in front of you when a family comes in and says, I think I need your help? Yeah, so Gary, it really is all over the map. I'm not on the 24 seven helpline, although because I started there, I will always get helpline. Um, there are people that the call that I just got that I'm gonna call after this is someone that wants information on how to get a diagnosis. Um, and you know, is there any medicine that can help my mom? That's the call that I just got. A lot of people will call regarding um, resources that can help them care for their loved ones at home. So they'll call regarding home care adult day center, as well as how can, are there programs that can help to pay for this? which allows us to connect you know, with the agencies on aging uh, regarding you know, their respite programs and, and the, Connecticut, the Connecticut home care program. So that comes up a lot. Um, and then sometimes it's just um, what changes um, are happening in their loved ones, whether it be around um, personal care challenges or communication or dementia related behaviors, and what are some tools for caregivers in those areas. And then also some people that are planning early and some people planning late for you know, what if this care can't happen in the home? And I was one of those people that we, we were able to keep both my parents home, but I had the application for the one facility that I thought in Connecticut could really care for my dad with his dementia related behaviors. And, you know, had I filled it out partially, but no, you know, and it's, it's hard to plan, but, you know, some people that are planning ahead and other people, um, when we're seeing that perhaps for their particular situation, the, the health of the caregiver, for example, that keeping someone home is difficult, trying to gently have them plan to be on waiting lists. So those things come up a lot. It's all over the map, really, in terms of um, reasons why people reach out. Gary, you know, we, we get a lot of people who call the agency on aging with questions about dementia. And, and as Maria pointed out, they usually are looking for uh, resources. Um, you know, where, how do I get services? And I think it's really important, and we're glad to answer that question. But we try always to refer them back to the Alzheimer's Association for education, mm -hmm. education and training, because most people I find um, really are clueless about what to expect when you have a dementia diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, people are planning 30 years out, you know, like, how am I going to control for this over the next 30 years as if? it's a static condition, there's not gonna be any change. When in fact, we know it's a deteriorating condition and you can only plan as far as maybe the next few months and then reevaluate and reassess. And, and people really need an education about what it is and how it works and what happens in the brain and, and what happens in the lives of most people because then they start to get the importance of the planning and they start to recognize the importance of the support. And then before you know it, they're becoming advocates of uh, Maria Tomazetti. And they, you know, they just want to line up behind her and march uh, through this Alzheimer's experience. But people need that. They, they need that place and they need that sense of expertise and the, the breadth of experience that's there that the Alzheimer's Association and these individuals, because at least in Connecticut, the Alzheimer's Association is not a uh, big blur out there. It is human beings, people. We, we know their names. You know? We know who Christian Casada is. We know who Maria Tomazetti is. And these are people that you can trust and line up behind and know that as crazy as it is at home with you know, my relative, there's people who've been there who understand it, who can guide me. And um, for whatever reason they think they're calling the Alzheimer's Association, that call is really the first step to them getting you know, that service. And uh, we admire and appreciate it so much in the Agency on Aging. Yeah, I, uh, the interconnectedness of um, the support community, especially in Connecticut, maybe because it's, it's a small oh. state, is so uh, impressive. I've, I've always seen that when I you know, travel around and I, well, I travel around and I go to, uh, we host events and I'll introduce somebody uh, in the support community to someone else in the support community and they didn't know each other. Well, how did you not know each other? You know, and 
whatever city it is. But I've never had that happen in New Haven. I've never had that happen where I have to introduce somebody to somebody else because um, it is a very, uh, you know, it's a tight knit community, which is important it means wherever they step into the, the network, they, they get the support they need from the VA, Ron Budsman, Alzheimer's. Yeah. A warm handoff is much easier in Connecticut than in some states because most of us actually know each other. Yeah. And you have great pizza. So come on, those are two. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have great pizza. We have the best pizza. I know that's with next. If we have to do it this way this year, and I'm, and, I, and, and, I'm, and I'm be thrilled to do it. I want someone to send me down the pizza from that main street in New Haven. <laughs> that's that's all I'm asking for. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and I want to do something that anybody who's been with me before knows that I do, and anybody new will probably never be with me again. But, um, Murray. I'll start there. Um, what's the one most important piece of advice you think a family caregiver needs to have? That there's no dumb question. I think people are afraid to ask and afraid to be honest about what their expectations are. They think that, you know, everyone knows this. They don't. Um, I sometimes feel badly because the group of us, as um, pointed out, a lot of us have worked together for a long, long time. And so 30 years in, yeah, guess what? I could have the answer to a lot of these questions, but I wouldn't be able to tell you the first thing about IT. Um, so I would say, ask the questions, be fully informed and have the conversations with your loved ones when you can, um, because you, as been pointed out many times today, you don't wanna be making decisions or um, trying to fulfill someone's wishes without fully understanding. Every question is important that a caregiver, there's no dumb, inappropriate, stupid question a caregiver can ask uh, uh, other than the one you don't ask. The one you ask is the one that, uh, that you're afraid to ask for some reason is the one most important question you need to ask. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. I'll go around the room again. Bonnie, one most important piece of advice you'd like to share with family caregivers. Take care of yourself. Never feel guilty about it. You need to do it to be the best caregiver that you can be. Can't be that. They feel guilty. No, and again, guilt, shame, fear, embarrassment. These are things that caregivers need to kick out of their mm -hmm. lexicon. Of anybody in the world who doesn't right. feel those things, caregivers <laughs> don't deserve to feel those things. So, thank you for that. Uh, hey, well, how about you, Doc? One most important piece of advice you'd like to share with family caregivers. Are you referring to me? Yes. Who, oh, who, I wasn't raise sure your hand if you're a doctor. doctor. Yeah. Maybe there's another doctor on the panel. I didn't want to take that for granted. So for me, it's, it's, it's the same thing. I've said it many times before, but the personal process of being a caregiver and the professional process of observing care, the caregivers through the people with whom I work, you have a choice in caregiving it, and it can be a burden. It can be the hardest thing you ever do. And you can wake up every day resenting the fact that your sister's not helping you and there aren't enough resources and the rules aren't right. Or you can choose to recognize the privilege you've been given to share in the life of someone else who trusts you enough to let you be their person, their representative, the person on whom they can depend for care. And that's an honor. And although there's a lot of work associated with it, it's, it's the work of heroes and it's, it's the work that requires and deserves affirmation and uh, encouragement and support but when it's all said and done and, and it ends, you're not a caregiver forever. When it ends, you have the pride in yourself. You have that sense that you did the right thing. You have the stuff that takes you to this next plane of living that goes way beyond the, I'm kind of tired. I didn't get to go get my nails done. Um, I didn't get to go out with the friends to book club. None of those things you'll remember. You'll remember that you have this trusted loving relationship. And by loving, I don't mean it's all peaches and cream. I mean, loving at the point of 
showing your compassion for another human being, true love, that you'll, you've been given the opportunity to take part in that. And that is not a burden. That's a blessing. You have the growth that comes with that. I think so. Uh, Maria, one most important piece of advice you'd like to share with family caregivers. I'd say that, um, and I'll speak the dementia world, but no two people with dementia are exactly alike. Um, no two caregiver journeys are exactly alike, but what is universal is that no one can really do this alone. Um, even though sometimes as caregivers, myself included, we think we can. So the importance of reaching out for help in whatever way is the best way for you, whether it be phone calls or groups or education or combination thereof, um, that no one could do it alone. And to for your own health and to Bonnie's point, taking care of yourself, that's an important step to reach out for help. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. It, isolation is a killer. And and again, we don't deserve, we don't deserve that. Even if you're alone and you're in a rural community, whatever, even this is connectivity. And hopefully you pick up the phone or or go online or email any number of the panelists here and go. I know you exist now. What can you do to help me? Jack, same question. First one, I got two, if you don't mind. And I won't take long. The, the first one is uh, if you go to my website, send.checklist.com, there's a in the navigation, there's caregiver, and caregiver is on sale for you guys at a special price. So, you know, if you're interested in buying, you can get it on the web. Second, there is a God. He's a real person to me, and he's about love. And the foot soldiers of God are the caregivers. And they need to take, God wants you to know that you're doing right. And, and then the other part of it is hug somebody, get the smile on their face because it'll get on your face as well. And I do this with business owners. They they get and I go. This is I'm not that guy, Jack. He says, "Well, you are with the hand of God." So and and so he now hugs and he smiles and and that's really what you guys are about. Is about the hand of God goes through you to them. So think about that as you go. Get a hug from somebody. My wife gets one every day and a kiss. She has a bad day. She smiles. That's how it works. Do it for yourselves. That's it. By the way, that's the name of your, that's the title of your next book. Caregivers are the foot soldiers of God. Love that. Cool. So, cool. Thank you, both my panels. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Area Agents and Aging. Thank you, Ombudsman. Thank you, VA. Thank you. Uh, Alzheimer's Association. Thank you, Sunja Checklist. <laughs> thank you, Mary Wade. Thank you, uh, Drazen Rubin. Uh, thank you. Who'd I miss? Uh, Gar uh, Gary? No. What the hell is his name? David. The chair. Thank you, thank you Dr. David Carson. Uh, and uh, God bless you all. And uh, just like to leave with something that, if you're my age or older, will mean something to you. I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> and if you're younger, go away. Take care. Um, free, free complimentary weekly newsletter and stuff I learned here, I'm going to steal on caregiver.com. And we'll see you in person or through this screen next year.